Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. You doing okay today? John, I'm just looking forward to June 21st and maybe because it's the first day of summer either. <laughs> Yep. I'll probably, oh, yes. Did you want to read this? Yeah. More than six I did. Oops. They wouldn't take me. I wanted to. Too ready? old? My feet have gotten flat. I don't know what happened. Yes, sir. <laughs> I like that when he said, what were you thinking? You told me not to think. <laughs> Did you want to read this? Yep. Call the meeting to order. Are we in the overflow or? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Mr. Lashley, you have the honors. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for another wonderful, glorious day that you have created. Dear Lord, give us the strength and wisdom to make the proper decisions for the citizens of Alamance County. And dear Lord, we know that all things are possible through you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Sheriff. Yes, sir. Would you approach? Yes, sir. I understand you have some people that need and deserve recognition. Yes, sir. <laughs> Would you bring your folks forward one at a time, please? Sure. Take Matthew Sharp first. Smith. All right. We have two officers in our presence tonight that have literally saved lives. And we are really, really pleased to have these gentlemen with us uh, and to make this presentation. First off, on February 23rd, 2022, at approximately 11 a.m., Lieutenant Matt Sharp, raise your hand, <laughs> and Deputy Tyler Smith, raise your hand. No difference in Responded to the, and I'm going to ask you what a 66 BLK is. Block. 66 something? Block. 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 Got it. Okay. Well, I, I could not read the block part. <laughs> uh, Jim Pickett wrote a snow camp in reference to a su suicidal attempt. Upon arrival, the officers observed a male standing under a tree in the front yard of one end of a rope attached to the tree and the other end wrapped around his neck. As the officers pulled into the driveway, the male allowed his body to go limp in an attempt to hang himself. Both officers immediately ran to the subject, where Deputy Smith lifted the male up by the waist to take the pressure off his neck, and Lieutenant Sharp cut the rope with his body on. Once the rope was cut, they laid the subject on the ground on his side to keep his airway open and removed the other piece of the rope from around his neck. They called EMS and, re, uh, and referenced aid, and uh, rend, excuse me, rendered aid. EMS arrived shortly thereafter, uh, rendered further aid, and transported the patient to the hospital. We believe, in fact we know, had it not been for Lieutenant Sharp and Deputy Smith, and they not acted in the manner that they did, Mr. Herring would have passed away. We recognize you guys. 
if we have a plot. Detectives Gina Van Horn, Bajan, and Joshua Shumate observed a vehicle on Piedmont Way and Bevin Street in Burlington being swept away by floodwaters caused by the torrential downpour of rain. The officers called communications to advise their location and status. While ready radioing their communications, the officers realized that there were passengers still in the vehicle. As the floodwaters continued rising, the vehicle began to submerge. Both officers noticed that their male driver was holding a child up high enough to keep its head above the water. Must have been very scary. Without hesitation, both officers jumped into the rushing water and began pulling five passengers, one adult and four children, out of the vehicle to safety. Without quick and decisive action, by Detective Van Horn and Detective Shumate, the outcome would have been very different and we could have lost five citizens. We want to say thank you and we're presenting you with thank you. Thank you. Honor, thank you. Sir. Same to you, young man. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good job, guys. say young because they're definitely way, way younger than I am, just received a national award. <clears throat> Terry told me they were going to Washington, D.C., but I think it was close to Arlington. Yes. <laughs> uh, and received a high recognition for what they have done, what they did, to save a 13-year-old young lady. On Wednesday, May the 25th, 2022, National Center for Missing and exported children in Arlington, Virginia, honored officers who went above and beyond to help protect children. When a 14-year-old girl was abducted in Davidson County by someone she met online and taken more than 700 miles from her home, six agencies across the state, the states, came together to make sure the girl made it back safely to her family thanks to these guys. Elements County Special Victims Unit investigators discovered the same person was also taking, taking was also taking to several other juvenile, uh, the, excuse me, the person was also ta uh, talking to several other juvenile females in Elements County. The Elements County Sheriff's Office was able to interview these juveniles and use forensic computers Technology, computer technology to provide beneficial information that led to the identity of the suspect and the location of the child. Lieutenant Austin and uh, Ray of the Alameda County Sheriff's Office each received a hero award for their hard work and dedication during the investigation. We want to say thank you. And I would like to add a little something to that. Had they not been able to identify the individual 
and put it out all over the nation, that little girl probably would not be safe. An officer uh, spotted the car in Arkansas and was shot four times, and the little girl was able to escape from the car, and other officers, the little girl, the officer lived. He got shot in the leg, the chest, the arm, through the mouth, the lips. Thank you. commissioners would like to say to law enforcement to Sheriff Johnson and your entire crew thank you you always come through and do a super super job you save lives and children thank you okay guys um, we have an agenda uh, would anybody like to approve it Motion to approve. We have a motion? Second. And a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 There are no opposed. It's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Public speakers. We have two. Uh, Mr. Morgan. Each, each speaker, as you already know, you have three minutes, and we appreciate it. Okay. I got a little handout. Can I hand it? Yes, sir. You can do that for you three minutes, sir. <laughs> all of you. Me practice on this. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you sent this out earlier to us by email, did you not? I did. I just want to make sure everybody got it. I apologize. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. My name is uh, Philip Morgan, 1300 Bonfire Drive, Mavin, North Carolina. Um, good evening. I'm here to talk, of course, about the new RV ordinance. It's been a long process, and I'm hoping after tonight. We have ordinance that's good for all. Um, I just want to address a couple. Of, one thing's been added. Language has been added to address the land separation. I've seen from time last this meeting to this meeting about the addition of earth burns to alleviate. I'm, I'm not sure where that come from, but this is only adding the construction costs and accomplishing very little as far as protection for neighbors. Uh, it's creating a five foot tall pile of dirt about 30 to 40 feet wide. And um, it's, it's, I don't, I don't see the accomplishment. Maybe extra screening in, in lieu, maybe. Um, and there was something about a private playground. We need something on the definition of a private play. A private playground was that a single sandbox swinging in a tree? I mean, I'm, I'm just, I would have confusion on that one. Um, the standard we, we would like to see that are both feasible and offer protection to the adjoining properties. Ours follows, and they're, they're in the handout. I mean, I can go over them here, you know, the, the setback. We put on there what they are, page number, you know, 30 foot to the 50. I don't really see if I need to go through it or it's on, on the paper. Um, I hope I, you know, hope we get a good ordinance that'll let us build a facility for Alamance County that's proud to have in their community that serves the people here and serves the people that come to here. That's, that's our goal. We're not we're not looking to create something bad for the community. We want something good. Um, I'm good. I didn't use all my time. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank we you, appreciate Bill. it. Myron Prevat, and state your name if you will. And my name is Myron Prevat. I live at 2231 West Front Street, Burlington. I come for you tonight asking that we finalize this RP, the RV Park ordinance in this meeting. We have asked that it be approved with only a few changes. I first want to address land spacing. People just, just like you and I occupy RVs and campers. They are not aliens. They, they go to school, they go to church, they go to parks and playgrounds, they live in houses and mobile homes. So why can't we put a nice RV park next to these things? 
RV parks have curfews always at 10 to 11 o'clock. The same time we go to bed when we are home. RV parks are not a nuisance or a party place. They are a getaway for rest and relaxation. With this said, I ask that you eliminate land spacing from this ordinance. Changing the setback from 50 to 30 feet with a proposed buffer in this ordinance will be sufficient for privacy of a neighbor and the RV park occupant. I ask that we change this setback. In the screening section of this ordinance, I ask that we have a second option that will allow us to put nice landscaping so that we can enhance our interests to our parks, RV parks. I ask that we change the road width from 26 foot to 24 feet. My office is located on Church Street. It is a four lane road and each lane is 11 feet wide. That's to the gutter. If this is sufficient for a four lane road with a 35 mile an hour speed limit, it should be sufficient for an RV park with a five mile an hour speed limit. In the second section of landscape buffers, it states that if any portion of a park in both, let's see, let me start over. In the second section of landscape buffers, it states that if any portion of any park is both within a thousand feet and visible from any school, church, or residence, then the park owner will be required to install additional screening from view with a buffer strip or screen fence. My property is located on Swept Sacks Road in Alamance County. There are houses all up and down that road with, uh, that are only 50 feet off the road. Does this mean I need to plant two rows of trees across my property so it cannot be seen? If so, or in this case, you'll have campers missing my campground, having to go down further and turn around <coughs> creating a traffic hazard. If you're driving a F-350 truck and pulling a 40-foot camper, and you're in the country and you can't see a, the RV park for the screening they're asking for in the front, it's going to create a traffic hazard, is my point there. Hmm. I ask that you approve this ordinance with these changes and thank you for your service to our community. And we thank you. Thank you. These are the only speakers that signed up. Um, we have a consent agenda. Do we have any motions? Or? Motion to approve. Second. A motion and second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh -huh. And there are no uh, otherwise. So it's unanimous. Mr. Scott, are you going to? Yes, sir. Good evening, board. Good evening. Next on the agenda is the second um, meeting to hear the noise ordinance per the statutes uh, because there is a criminal enforcement aspect to this. It needs to be heard at two different commissioner hearings. And at this one, uh, per the ordinance, we are having this uh, public hearing, which will follow my presentation. Uh, partner with my firm, Natalia Eisenberg, presented this ordinance at the previous meeting in May. Uh, on the 16th. Um, just to briefly recap, there is uh, two main changes. First, uh, just some cleaning up for minor edits, and then the other is for consistency. Uh, section 6B15 was eliminated, and some of the portions from that provision were brought over to section 714. Uh, this added uh, clarity, consistency, and ensured enforcement uh, by any law enforcement who was called to the scene. It also reincorporated uh, the times and days that the um, ordinance applies uh, to some businesses, and that was moved over to the 714 and uh, modified slightly. And that's what we have. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Board, we need to uh, have a public hearing regarding this matter. Do we need to have a motion to we open the, yeah. the meeting? Yes, sir. I'll All make right. a motion that we enter a public hearing. Second. 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 All right. We have a first and a second. I think Mr. Turner was a second. I'm sorry. All, right. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 
and nobody's opposed, it's unanimous. We are now in the public hearing. Do we have anyone that would like to address this board regarding this noise ordinance? Yes, sir. If you would state your name and address, and then it's, been over, I'm it's your time. <coughs> Good evening, uh, Ron Spinhoven, 2709 Quake and Bush Road in Snow Camp. And I'm um, speaking tonight regarding the proposed revisions to the 2019 Alamance County Noise, noise Ordinance. Did you give us your address? Yes. Yes. 2709 Quick and Bush Road. Thank you. Snow Camp. Um, specifically, section number 6, 15, and section 7, number 14. And in the months prior to the adoption of this ordinance, many Al Alamance County residents lobbied strongly to create language in the noise ordinance to restrict some class three heavy industry from operating 24 seven, 365 days a year, as there is no defined hours of operation in the Hido. These two paragraphs were added to address this omission. Board of Commissioners instructed the county attorney to add these provisions and unanimously voted to accept the document. In an email to Amy Gailey on August 27th, 2019, I pointed out that section six, number 15 was incorrectly formatted, making it look more like an exception, which would be in section seven, and not a loud or unreasonable noise as it was intended in the title of section six. Um, so I recognize that there was, myself, that there was a flaw in the wording there. Um, as written in the ordinance, number 15, except uh, number 615, except when operated Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. through 5 p.m., all operations at mining, quarrying, chemical manufacturing, asphalt plants, electricity generating facilities, landfills, except inner debris and cement manufacturing. To conform to the rest of the section's formatting, it should have read, all operations at mining, quarrying, chemical manufacturing, asphalt plants, electricity generating facilities, landfills, except inner debris and cement manufacturings, except when operated on Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. through 5 p.m. This was in more consistent with the rest of the wording in that section. Commissioner, then Commissioner Chair Gailey told me that although I was correct, she thought it was it would take another vote to correct it, and she didn't think it was warranted, as the intention was clear. Well, here we are, less than three years later, and it has come back to haunt us. Additionally, Section 714, normal sounds associate, associated, and this is under the, um, the exceptions, normal sounds associated with or customarily to customary to properly permitted industrial or manufacturing operations in the normal course of business and within the normal operating hours for such industrial or manufacturing operations provided loud and unreasonable noise as defined in section six, and that's the point, coming from industrial or manufacturing operations on Sundays before 6 a.m. or 7 p.m. Monday through Friday. The words as defined in section six have no reference if section 615 is removed. And I make a suggestion that 615 be changed to all noise associated with operations at mining, <coughs> quarrying, chemical manufacturing, asphalt plants, electricity generating facilities, landfills except inert debris, cement manufacturing, and sawmills operating outside of the hours defined in section 714. And the only change in 714 that I suggest that, yeah. that we make is that... Sir, I'm, I'm truly okay. sorry. Uh, but there's a, there's a word may in there, which I think yeah. needs to be You're beyond out. our three minute limit and our, my county attorney is telling me correctly that I must cut you off. I, I apologize. All right. And hopefully you read my emails. Yes, sir. We did. I did. Appreciate yes, it. Thank you. So three minutes does apply. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. I thought it was fine for public hearing. Yeah, I thought it did not work on public hearing. Um, 
Any other speakers on this side? Yes, sir. <coughs> Hey, my name is Trip Overholt, and um, about a month ago I got COVID, so I have a little residual hack. So if I cough, I apologize. Um, so just in reference to what Ron was talking about, uh, the ordinance basically uh, was unreadable in its format. I don't know how that happens because you would think it would get looked at carefully and make sense, but it didn't. And it referred to another section where you would think that what constitutes an unreasonable noise by one of those uh, businesses would be defined, but that's not there in the uh, ordinance. So reasonable people would like to see both the description of what constitutes an unreasonable noise intrusion to be defined. We'd like to see the ordinance clarified so that we're protected from listening to stuff that we have to listen to in the middle of the night. <clears throat> so for example, right now I live two miles from um, the, uh, the, uh, the mill <clears throat> um, on Lindley Mill Road. And it's, it's okay, it's right at the threshold, but it's got this high pitch sound from grinders that penetrates right into your brain at two o'clock in the morning when it's running. It's set Sunday night at 2 a.m. Now, <clears throat> they can probably figure out a way to get their work done in the time they need to. So that's the kind of thing we need protection from, where you're lying in bed and you can't sleep because you've got a noise grinding in your brain and there's nothing you can do about it. Without you guys addressing the ordinance, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're basically open to that sort of thing happening. So I hope that when you guys vote, you vote to make sure that that get, all gets cleaned up, both the, <clears throat> the part that it refers to and then the language as well. And I don't know what the attorney, um, you know, what they did, because we haven't had an opportunity to review what, how they cleaned that up. So, you know, maybe what I'm saying is unnecessary, but since I don't know what you guys did, got to bring it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Any other speakers on? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Duane, and I live uh, 2705 Quakenbush Road in Snow Camp. And um, I wanted to just start off by saying thank you for some great uh, reporting um, last week. Um, really uh, coined a new term in, uh, in Snow Camp, uh, floof. <laughs> we had a big oh. floof this afternoon. Oh. Floof is the description that the uh, attorney for the mine used to describe how <coughs> low key and how it's nothing but a floof when one of these sonic booms goes off in our neighborhood. And one of them went off today, 4.16 p.m. Boom. And I am two miles away. And that's a floof. How is it for the people who are right there? I mean, for me, it's, it's jarring and it sounds like a plane crashed or something happened, you know? starring from two miles away. How do the people who are like, you know, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand feet away who are having their homes shaken and whatnot. So anyway, floof is going down in history um, and will be much heard, I'm sure. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, something about these uh, so-called good corporate citizens they declare to be um, in the re beautiful reporting on last week. Um, Good corporate citizens care about their community. And we have not seen anything that even resembles a four-letter word called care about our community from these operators. They've ignored us. Um, they've completely refused to, you know, they just work against us. And they've scoffed the law, and almost proudly in that story, declared that they've paid their 16,500 in fines. Like, wow, should we pat them on the back? They knowingly and willingly <coughs> operated without a permit. And so they've been slapped on the hand, thank you for following through, and, uh, and they declare themselves good corporate citizens. So in terms of what Ron was just saying about Saturday operations, Boy, if you had come to the listening session we had at the Snow Camp School a few months ago, and it's actually April 11th, 
you would have seen several people, one in particular I remember, a woman who lives near the mine, or the quarry, in tears, absolutely in tears, because she said she cannot sit outside on Saturday mornings and have her coffee after working her tail off all week long. She wants to come home and just have peace on the weekends. So I would like to really encourage you to not allow heavy industry to operate on Saturdays in Snow King. Because that's just, that's just adding insult to injury, salt in the wound. I mean, please. And your good corporate citizen, our good corporate citizen friends should understand. And then next time I'll talk about the trucks pulling out of Workman Road and flying up behind me on a Friday afternoon. And I went 45 miles an hour the rest of the way, and they weren't too happy about it. We there thank were you. two of them fully loaded right on me. Any other speakers on this side of the room? Any speakers on this side of the room? Are there any speakers in the annex? Okay. Do we have a motion to close? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Motion to second. All in favor of closing the close of the uh, public hearing, indicate by saying aye. 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 Again, it's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Turner, I think you wanted to be recognized at this point. Oh, uh, that's fine. Uh, Mr. Scott, I had, a, I had a question about the elimination of um, subparagraph 15 from the definition of what constitutes loud, and disturbing, and unnecessary noise. Is Correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that the, the main problem with that provision was that it, it affects the use of of the land, meaning the operations themselves, and not the noise from the operations. That is correct, sir. And that there's a enforcement problem with that language. Yes, and as it was written, uh, it conflicted with 714, causing some ambiguity. So by cleaning it up and removing 615, moving that language into 714, uh, it clarified that. And I uh, just want to point out that the request to, to put 615 back in and to reference back would only limit that reference to 615 and not the rest of the definition of uh, loud and unreasonable noise. So by uh, that elimination and the reference strictly only to section uh, six as a whole, rather than that one subsection, captured more than it did before. Okay, and as 14 is written, based upon the change, it, it actually creates, the ordinance creates an exception to the definition of what is loud and unnecessary noise by saying that if you're, if anyone, if any company, regardless of the type of company, is operating, uh, I'm sorry, no, a properly permitted industrial or manufacturing operation, if they're operating in the normal, normal course of business and have been permitted, and are operating in their normal operating hours, then that is an exception to the noise ordinance unless that noise is generated before six or after seven on weekdays and Saturdays and Sundays. Monday through Saturday, none on Sunday. Okay. Um, I, I think we, we have to change it to make it enforceable. Yes. Um, one question I have, I, I understand that folks at Snow Camp are, particularly folks who live down there close to the mine are upset and are nervous uh, about the change here. A and I, I wonder if, if it might assuage some of those concerns if we make the time restrictions that's currently in subsection 15 of section six, with the, if we make them the same as those as an exception in paragraph 14. So that the restriction that currently exists would be the restriction that exists after this meeting. Is that, uh, would that, comport with what your idea of what would be enforceable? Yes, I just want clarification. So the, there's a time difference, but there's also a date difference. Well, we want to make sure we understand both of those. 615, as originally written, I believe was Monday through Friday. Right. 714 now says Monday through Saturday. Okay. And that's because we have some current um, as one of the speakers said, current use on Saturday. So that would be capturing that use. 
Okay. To allow operation as as theirs. Thank you. Anything else? Nothing else. Mr. Carter. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Lashley. And I don't either. But Craig, he uh, definitely was, cleared it up. He actually was focused on what I was focused on. Do we have a motion? Let me ask. Could I ask one more question, Mr. Sir. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Scott, if we amend the the language here, do we have to, do we have to have another hearing? No. Okay. The reason for it is to get feedback from the public, so we receive that tonight. But there have to be two readings, right? Yes. If we amend, does it require another? reading because of the criminal statutes that, apl that apply here? I would say no because the criminal statutes haven't been addressed and modified at all. We are only discussing what the parameters and the spirit is trying to capture. Uh, the new statute that requires two readings is vague and it just says uh, before it can be passed it has to have two readings. It doesn't speak on if, amend if amendments happen during those two meetings. And as I understand it, if there's an industrial use that happens outside of the times that were that are in the statute, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that they that those sounds are necessarily loud and, and unnecessary noise. It means you go to the previous definition for what those are defined as and make that decision there. Yes. Okay. And to address one of the speakers, he uh, focused on the word may instead of is a violation. Uh, we believe that the word may is good because it allows the sheriff's office to respond and uh, view everything in the totality of the circumstances and make a dis discretion, uh, discretionary decision. As Mr. Turner already knows as an attorney and I know, the law very, has a very different meaning for may and shall. Shall means it will happen. May means the sheriff has some discretion. Well, I'll make a motion, Mr. Chairman, that we accept the uh, the changes to the noise ordinances as written, except that we amend section six, I'm sorry, section 714 to say where the red lines are, provided loud and unreasonable noise as defined in section six coming from industrial or manufacturing operations on Saturdays, Sundays, or before 7 a.m., or after 5 p.m. Monday through Saturday, I'm sorry, Monday through Friday may constitute a violation of this ordinance. Okay, you want to repeat that, please? Yeah. He's changing the time from right. changing the Six times to incorporate what day. currently exists in Section 15 above. Perfect. Just for clarification, times and dates. Right. Times you added the Saturday in there to the Sunday, so you take out. And make it seven to seven from Monday to Friday. Seven to five. Seven to five Monday through Friday. As written in the current section 15. General, I'm going to oppose that motion simply because I think that's too restrictive for a manufacturing and commercial operations. Uh, tonight it's going to be still light at 8:30 p.m. And you want to cut all industry off at five o'clock? I, I can't agree with that. I would have make an alternative motion that we leave it as is, six to seven p.m. Not make that change. So that is a motion as well, uh, Ms. Turner. We don't have a second on either of our motions. So, <laughs> would anybody like to uh, second either motion? I'll second, Mr. Tom's, uh, Mr. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Thompson. Well, he's not here right oh, now. Right. Uh, <laughs> they are looking up for me. <laughs> I, I, Craig, I, I actually like where you're coming from on this. Uh, uh, you know, we should actually listen to our citizens when they tell us that Saturday's a big pain in their butt. I'm with you that we probably should not be curbing business. It does hurt my feelings, but when you have people who live right next door saying, hey, look, this ain't working out for us, I think we should listen to them. And so that's why uh, I second Mr. Turner's motion. Absolutely. I'm just curious, um, the rock quarry going past the hospital, 
was that just everything was just fine yeah. or was there was there the same kind of situations I know anything that moves into your neighborhood that's different is an adjustment I mean it just is especially when it goes boom and um, I was just curious is that city of Burlington okay I just wonder hospital moved out there so okay all right. Right well and and I just know May and shall is a big deal yes. I, I, I mean that's like that's, that's a big deal. I'm just curious as to what more kind of responsibility this is going to put on the sheriff's department. Do you have a gun or a meter or something that you going how do you go measure what's too loud or not too loud? And are you going to go out there every time someone calls? I mean, just tell me the truth. I need to know this because that's like we you don't, don't have, have a lot of time. A meter. Uh, you can do it for decibels, but we don't have the technology in hand in the sheriff's office to do that. Okay. Well, you got a call too. By the time you got out there, there would no longer be a boom. Right. It's gone, so. It, it. This, this statute doesn't address decibels anyway. Well, so. I know, but if, um, if I don't like it now, I'm probably not going to like it later. No. And if I know I'm supposed to call my sheriff, I'm going to call him, and that puts him in a, like Solomon, which which mother, which baby are you gonna give to which mother, so to speak? And I, I'm just, we just seem to keep uh, expanding this to have one more, one more thing. And I don't know, it's kind of like zoning we talked about. You know, if we don't have something in our county with zoning, this is not, this is just the beginning. And you know, because we don't have that kind of magic wand that we can say no to. And is this kind of situation here going to give us power to really, you know, rule over this quarry or this whatever that's got that? What if somebody has a um, race car driver, race car, and they like to crank it up and work on the carburetor? And you know, if you're 17 years old, it's like, and that's what you do. So I'm just, I'm just curious, how, how far does this go? You know, I understand frustration from everybody, but you know, we got to make a decision and we just keep seeming to add on one more thing and I don't think the add on one more thing is the real issue. Well, it's 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 a difficult thing to tell a business that they're trying to operate that they can't operate 6 days a week. I mean, basically telling them they can't operate but 6 days a week in the original plan, cutting them back to 5 days a week. But I don't, I'm sorry, I don't I'm know if um, I, I, I've got to believe that the guys out at Martin Marietta on, on Huffman Mill have stopped blasting because we live about a mile from there and I, of course I'm about half deaf too, but <laughs> as most of you all know, but <laughs> my wife has super perfect hearing and I don't think I've ever heard her say she heard a blast, so I don't know. But. Um, I can't imagine spending your day listening to that either. So, or not well, being able to enjoy your across, front porch. Uh, you can live across from anything that that noise is their business. You know what I mean? And um, and it's it's just a hard call. It really is. Mr. Lashley, anything else? No. Mr. Thompson. No. What is the motion? Which one? Mr. Uh, Turner, I, would you, you second? repeat second. your motion, please? Craig's was to five. Monday through Friday. Okay. I had to get, get back to the language I'd moved on. I'm sorry. Yeah, he changed the hours from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. and he, uh, the cutoff from um, 6 a.m. To, to, to 5 p.m. And it's added Saturday. Yeah. Which is the current restriction in the court in the ordinance as written. Which days? Monday through Friday. Yeah. Uh, both. Yeah. Call the question. Does that mean going in by five, or does that mean leaving by five? What, what it means. What it means is the statute creates an exception for the. It creates an exception for industrial or manufacturing operations. The noise generated by manufacturing and industrial operations properly permitted in the normal course of business as amended Monday through Friday 7 to 5. 
and that exception is removed for all other times. And then to evaluate whether there's harmful noise, you go to the definitions higher in the statute. So it just limits the exception. So the exception is the 5 p.m. versus 6 p.m.? Sort the, ex of kind of? the exception is normal operations properly permitted between 7 and 5 on weekdays. Okay. That's the exception. Which Outside was the, the language that was in 15. Which was the language that was in 15. And Saturdays is what? Saturdays is not part of the exception. Sunday is not part of the exception. So you would go to the language that defines unreasonable noise during those times. All those days, right. So you can be open on Saturday as long as you're not real loud. Not blasting. As long as you're not too loud. Yep. According to the sheriff. That's right. Okay. Let me make sure I understand. On section seven fourteen, the last sentence, you're changing the hours order before 6 a.m. you're changing that to 7 a.m. right yes. and or after 7 p.m. to 5 p.m. Correct. Monday through Friday, Monday through Friday. correct so yes six to seven but it says Monday through Saturday you're changing that to Friday to Friday, Friday. Mm -hmm. Just take it Saturday out. No blasting on Saturday. any other discussion just one more thing if we change these hours what is next? Nothing. No, I mean, what what's going to be next? Because there's there's going to be a next. I'm just asking a question. Because we've changed a lot of different things, and there's still a next. And now we're changing this. Is this going to completely? Is this going to satisfy that community? As to will this? Is this a compromise that they will be okay with? Well, actually, Ms. Thompson. <coughs> That's the same language that was in the original ordinance, was a Monday through Friday and 7 to 5. So the proposal is a change. What is proposed is a change from the original versus this being a change. Other than this is a change from the proposal, but it's not a change from the original ordinance. So. And this just isn't about a rock quarry. This is about anything that's loud. Right. Industrial or manufacturing operations. Okay. However, if uh, another kind of situation like this checks all the boxes in Raleigh and we don't have any kind of zoning, That's we right. can be right back in this situation with a whole new world. It's possible. Okay. Just putting that out there. <laughs> I don't know how probable it will be, but it's possible. Any other discussion? Oh, no. I don't. Mr. Jarvis, call the question. All in favor of his motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh -huh. All opposed? No, I'm one no. Okay, our next item is um our twenty 22 2023 and miss hook um if you'll just open us up sure commissioners on may 16th the manager's recommended budget was presented a public hearing regarding the budget was held on june 6th tonight i'm asking uh, the commissioners to discuss make recommendations and adopt a budget I'm here along with our budget and finance team to answer any questions that you might have. And please keep in mind that a budget must be adopted by June 30th. Thank you. And I know that I have talked to each and every and Thomas, we have not violated the open meetings law, uh, commissioner individually. Um, and so I sort of think I know where we're headed with this. Um, but I would like to at least make a motion as follows. One, we're going to support the 14 new positions for the school system as follows. One, they are not necessarily all SROs, but some can be retired sworn officers uh, as approved, I assume, by our 
sheriff uh, or the proper, proper authority. Um, the 14 positions would be as follows. One, the four positions that we already have in the recommended budget, so that's already uh, funded, and, the, um, and so that, th those positions we already have in our budget currently. The next six positions um, we've identified with the help of our financial folks, $375,000 uh, that are fines and fees that will be as ordered coming from, uh, to the um, Almas Barrington school system, and that would cover the six additional positions. So you have four plus six, counting for 10 total positions using the um, ABSS $375,000 in fines and fees. And then we would approve an additional four, uh, four positions that would come from our budget um, and they would be uh, derived from, um, we did not have a second primary, so the Board of Elections has $90,730 that was not used that is currently in our budget. And we have additionally um, $170,270 if we hold on to, uh, we have several new positions that uh, we have in our current a budget, they would be held open until September 1st. By holding those positions open until September 1st, uh, then that would generate $170,270 for a total of $245,000. Uh, those uh, open positions that are being held would not include the landfill position. That's a separate budget in its entirety, and so we are not including the landfill position which would be filled, we assume, on or before or on July 1st. Those uh, four additional uh, positions. That amount is 261, Oh, I'm sorry. That's correct. It's not 245. It is, re repeat the uh, total. 261,000. 261, Even. Even. Thank you. Which generates the cost for these four positions. Thank you. Um, we're going to put those four additional positions in place to be held in the county manager's fund. Um, and so they would be placed there available for the school system, but you've got to have in position the first ten positions, our four, your six, with a total of ten, before we open the funds for uh, the additional four positions. So. Um, you need to work with the sheriff and get those positions filled as quickly and as efficiently as you possibly can. That's not part of the motion. <laughs> can, can I ask a question, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Does these monies include the uniforms, the guns, and the vehicles? Ms. Hook, would that include that? It does not. It does not. Yeah. How, many, how many vehicles, Sheriff? Sure? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> All right. Um, we're also recommending, and that's what we can do, um, you're being given from us in our current budget $3.3 million, as you have, we've set aside every year. Uh, you also have $1.9 million from sales tax, which has to go to capital as well. So you basically have $5.2 million and we're recommending that you use that for school safety. That would be your passes, your doors, your locks, your whatever. Uh, and then we're encouraging you to use some of your URSA money if, Mr. Teeter, you think that's possible. We know that um, some other counties, we've seen news uh, print that showed that they did set aside monies and are using that for um, things even like SRO officers. We're not asking that you use it for SRO officers. We're asking that you use it for school improvements. Safety. Focus on safety. School safety, thank you. Uh, additionally, we're asking for uh, a one cent tax reduction. We're trying to give back to you taxpayers. Uh, we would love to give more, but 
Having said that, looking at the economy, we're afraid to do more than a penny at this time. We hope to be able to look at it again next year and have better news than we're anticipating. Additionally, as part of my motion, um, I've talked to the sheriff numerous times and he has, I believe, approved this. Um, where he wants three forensic officers. We have in our current budget one forensic officer approved in our current recommended budget. We're going to add two more to that for a total of three forensic officers, um, but he's agreed to give up five vehicles. And he's, he's talked to, I think, most of the commissioners, maybe all, um, and approved the uh, giving up of the five vehicles, and I'm asking that we approve the three forensic positions. Additionally, we have um, Veterans Services is asking for a, an additional member that would be a fifth member they currently have four. Um, I'm going to recommend we do that subject to the following. One, that new position be used in part for transportation of veterans. The sheriff has agreed to release one of his vans. In fact, a good van has got a front and rear air conditioning and uh, more than my vans used to have. So, <laughs> um, and that new officer, in part, be required to um, accommodate Alamance County residents, and I emphasize Alamance County um, residents for transportation to or from the VA center in Kernersville or Durham or wherever. And of course that new person could contact ACTA, which could pick them up regardless of handicap and so forth, and transport them to a PART, P-A-R-T is the abbreviation for that, uh, or the Orange County Transportation or whichever, or possibly even a PART could of course transport to Kernersville, and Orange uh, County or Orange Transportation could take them to into Durham out of Alamance County. And we're recommending that uh, preference be given to Alamance County veterans. Currently, we understand that that is not being done. Uh, is, they're not giving preference to Alamance County residents. And we as a board, with this motion if passed, would recommend that Alamance County residents be given preference. That is my motion. Do we have to get a second and then discussion, or do Absol we talk about it? We need a, okay. we'd like to have a second. I'll second your motion. Thank you. Chairman Paisley. Yeah, Mr. open it up. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Got a question. Uh, if we have 10 security officers slash SROs for the schools, and we've covered, it, covered the, their salaries, but we haven't covered cars, and we haven't covered uniforms, and the sheriff's given up five cars. But do we have that many used cars sitting around the sheriff's lot that to staff to cover 14 officers? Oh, right now we don't. So, commissioners, I think the thought process would be that the city these these are for city schools, and that the municipalities would help in the uniform and the uh, and the cars. So. The sheriff may be helping, but also we would look to the muni municipalities to help that as well in that. That was my question. Uh, do we have any And firm? we're just basing that on the request that came from the school system. Okay. Um, do we have any firm acknowledgement from these municipalities that they're willing to help? No, we do All not. Right, so we're going to have to go talk to them. Mm -hmm. I think we can do that. Yep. I've already reached out to most of the folks. I have too. Didn't really know exactly what to ask for, but now I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, well, keeping in, in line with that line of, community, of conversation, I, I don't know that it's really our call. I mean, we're going to be exactly. I mean, we'll, so as I add this up, with the 375 and the 261, that's 636, which is over and above the 522 which is what the school system said they needed over and above for SROs. But it holds some in reserve for the second semester that is in your budget that we can allocate as needed. 
but so we allocate the money. I think the school system then has the opportunity and, and the duty to say this is how we're going to do that, which could involve, as the chairman said, a combination of retired officers plus full-blooded municipal SROs when they're there. I mean, I think that if the sheriff gets involved and gets some retired officers who and retired deputies who can serve in that role, that's probably a much quicker mm -hmm. avenue for having SROs in the schools by August the 29th. Right. August the 29th. The first day of school, 14 bodies in schools, August 29th. That's the goal. This allows that to happen. That funding is there. How they get there, I think, is up to the school system. Uh, and, 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 the, yeah. and working with the sheriff, working with municipalities, et cetera. How long does it take us to get an, a new SRO trained and prepared to go into the, into class, into the school? But we have our own instructors been trained by the straight sitting right here. At a very minimum, uh, training and standards requires a 40-hour basic SRO school. That's at the very minimum. And of course, on top of that, we were going to do some <clears throat> on-the-job training, for lack of better words, in addition to that as well. You can only learn so much sitting in a classroom, so probably a good two or three months anyway. But if you had to go out and hire a new SRO, a new SRO he's got to go through BLET, right? Mm -hmm. So how, lo how much does that extend the amount of time? You're talking about 40 hours for SRO training, but if you're bringing in somebody new that has to go through BLET, one, one thing I'd like to, to make sure the commissioners and everybody in here are aware of, several years ago, uh, training and standards changed, uh, maybe about four or five years ago, maybe six. One of the requirements uh, from the state level that you have to have to be assigned as an SRO, you have to obtain what's called general certification. In other words, you've got to complete that first year with the state. So that would, uh, that would be one issue that we would have to consider across the board. You can't take a new, you know, new officer straight out of basic law enforcement training and assign them to the school. Again, that's not our local decision, or but that's from training and standards. And right. Standard. Yeah, that, that change is, was effect, like I said, about five or six years ago. So, so in a nutshell, right. you have to have an officer with at least one continuous year of service under the belt before they can be assigned as an SRO. When I teach the basic SRO school, the training and standards has authorized me to teach. I have to fill out a form, it's called an F-20, that has to be sent to training and standards, and it does ask specifically for the date the officer attained general certification before they can be assigned. We'd like to acknowledge that we do have school board uh, members here present with us um, and other school officials that are, thank goodness, with us here tonight. They do care. Um, but it is going to require you guys to work with the Sheriff's Department and work with us and so forth. Local law enforcement. And the law enforcement primarily, and also the cities, uh, as Ms. Hook just indicated. Uh, cities ought to be providing these uh, cars and uniforms and so forth because those are the officers that are going to go into those city schools. Um, just remember at our meeting last week that um, all of these folks were there and they told us everything. And I think uh, Chief Long mentioned around $600,000 maybe because I think there are 30 plus uh, officers short for the city of Burlington Police. Unless they have a you know, lamp that they're going to rub to find something, that's not going to happen. And also, uh, SROs are not patrol officers, they're not detectives, they're not vice, they're not, they're not that. Um, they're a whole different breed and, and it's, a, it's like a calling, it really is and you just don't, if you're going to have law enforcement till you get to that point at the front door, that's one thing because um, the whole deal for me is security but you just don't put, it's like me watching Chicago Med and do you want me to do your surgery the next day because I've watched it? No, <laughs> no. And um, it just it's just like picked up that easy. This is training. This is, I mean, this is serious work. SROs are just a rare breed. And um, I, I just, um, it's just not going to be quick like that. And then and, and where's the, I mean, we can provide this money to the penny, and then where's their, all their equipment coming from? Because that just doesn't fall out of the sky either. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, 200000 for new gas bills, so to speak. Everything is on the rise. And so I just want us to think about that. We are real, real descriptive about what we're doing here, and we have some real precise orders of what we want done. And so um, 
we just have to make sure that between us and them there's trust because us and them are both elected one isn't more important than the other any kind of election we all serve we're public servants so um, I appreciate the numbers this took a lot of work to find but um, SROs aren't going to fall out of the sky. And it, I think I heard almost about a year to really get them solid in, six months, eight months, whatever. That's, um, the SROs I know can tell you the name of every kid in their school because that's the whole point is to build that relationship. Um, every, every role in law enforcement is gifted and direct and important, but you have to be really careful trying to crossbreed them because it doesn't work sometimes. I do want to point out one thing to the school board. You have to fill the first 10 positions, the four plus the six, before you get the additional four. Okay? Six would be in the first 10. No, in other words, our <laughs> last monies we put aside in the county manager's fund would come out for positions 11 and on. I think I asked you today, John, when just you and I talked. Um, <clears throat> what happens if they don't get that last four by that time period because I bet Brian Long would love to get 30 in that time period <laughs> if possible and we've seen shortages across the street in detention there was an article in the paper this weekend about this is across the state detention officers being short in the jail and we've read about things that happen that are not safe and so um, what happens to this two something um, if that is not completed, not to anybody's fault. It's just not there. My understanding is it's in the uh, manager's fund, mm -hmm. and therefore it would lapse. And then the okay. uh, city, the county commissioners <laughs> next year could pick it up or not. It'd be up to whoever's the sworn county commissioners at that point. Uh, but it would lapse. Like it's at that point. layaway. It would go into general fund and but next it's still year. There. It, well, the commissioners would have to vote again to reallocate it. Okay. In your next year's budget. Mm -hmm. okay. Correct. I'm gonna call the question. Uh, well, a more? couple more points. Yes. Uh, three related to schools and then one taxes. Um, Ms. Thompson brings up a, a great point about the time it takes to hire SROs. That's why retired officers are the key. Mm -hmm. to get short-term uh, by August 29th. And it, that may not take up the entire 522 <coughs> as well. So, I mean, that's I think that's the key. That'll be funded by tonight, and then we can start uh, beating the bushes to get 14 retired officers. Um, with regard to the 375, Ms. Hook, that is uh, that w what the school system's budget for fees is $800,000. Yes. And this money is over and above the eight hundred thousand dollars it's budgeted for last year, that the school system will get over and above what they haven't anticipated. Exactly. Okay. So there's a budget amendment that we will ask for later in this meeting for the three seventy five. It may not be exactly three seventy five. We're asking you to put that aside. It may be just a little bit less, but not significantly less. Okay. And then Mr. Chairman mentioned the one point nine million. What is the one point nine million? Uh, where does that come from? That's the sales tax. Is that is that what goes into the capital reserve? It is, yes. Okay, so we would are we is your understanding that we would be moving sales tax revenues that are currently in the capital reserve to ABSS to fund well, they'd have the option, but it's our intent that they'd fund safety improvements so to the school. That is the sales tax that was already going into right. the capital reserves for them. Sure, what yeah, you're asking that. is that they utilize that money for school safety. Okay. And that's a recommendation. We can't mandate that. Right. Is that over and above what, what we budgeted for, or is that just that just that was what we were budgeting for? That is what we were budgeting for. Yes. Yeah. It's just yeah. a recommendation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Taxes. Yeah, there's been, you know, I know there's been some talk in the community about the fact that this is a, a performance uh, measure with a one cent tax cut. Tax cut. It's it's not. I mean, while there are, you know, if you have a if you have a if you pay property taxes on your home, the difference may be thirty dollars on average. But we have to keep in mind that there there are farmers who pay a significant amount of money in property taxes, particularly with both their, the land and the equipment that they use to farm. Farming uh, is not becoming cheaper to farm these days, particularly with the cost of diesel. 
uh, we have to keep in mind both small and large businesses who, who we want to keep, who we want to attract. Uh, they pay a significant amount of money for property taxes, and so one cent reduction for, for those folks is a big deal to their budget. Uh, and we want to encourage continued investment in the county, uh, and we want to have a, a tax rate that, uh, that encourages that. So it's not performative. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Well, as John, as you've often pointed out, I too am married to a teacher. And she made it clear to me that there's more than a thousand hours of children's time in the schools. And the sheriff pointed out in our meeting early, last week that they part time, that, or that a retired officer, in order to maintain his benefits, would not be able to work more than a thousand hours a year. So it sounds to me like we would need to have more than 14 people to cover the 1,200 hours that each officer or that each position would be required to meet. So I'm thinking that we're actually looking at, and I don't know what that number is without running some calculations, but Bill's got his brain going over there. I can see the wheels turning already through his ear. Um, <laughs> There's nothing else in there. But I, I, I think we are uh, we are we're looking at probably needing more than 14 to make this work. I think if we get 14, we'll be lucky. extremely fortunate. I look forward to the school system having 14, much less any additional. We could address that at a later time. I, I'm just setting us up. I'm making I'm making us aware that we're probably looking at a budget amendment at some point to come back and address the need once we get the first 14. You're hoping. And, 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 and 200 hours is at the back end of the school year, too. It's not the front end. So sometime in that time frame, we're going to be looking at trying to bring in even more people. So, Can I, can I address that? Please. Okay. Um, the, I think you're right, Mr. Carter. I think it's going to be a little bit higher than we think. But as Ms. Thompson said, and, and, and this gentleman for the sheriff told us, that uh, it takes time. You have to have someone who's qualified to go in that school. Uh, what I would like to focus on, and it's always been my focus, is the meeting that we had on Tuesday. We learned from the school system that there are certain things that you can't use this money for. It has to be on capital projects. And, and I would like the commissioners to take a look at the financial report at the bottom of our amendment, our, our uh, agenda today, and, and take a look at the transactions in the balance sheet. Uh, what I want to bring focus to is the how the county takes it from the general fund and puts it in the capital reserve fund for the schools. The next ledger, the next thing in the ledger is transferring that money from uh, into the capital project fund. Now, the reason I want you to point out, I want to point that out to the school folks here, is there are certain ways. That's 5.2 million dollars that you can do capital projects with. My solution to this problem, since we have $5.2 million, which will solve this problem, is why can't we, instead of injecting it into the project fund, we keep it in the capital reserve fund so it gives you more options, and I'm an options guy, I like those a lot, to give you more options to fulfill the obligations that you see that you're going to have. That's a lot of money, and I just want to make sure that we don't cubbyhole this money so it can only be used for capital projects when we know we need this money for something that's not quote unquote capital project. And that's why I wanted to focus on is there a certain way that maybe in this budget that we could take some of that money and not cubbyhole it so it only has to be used for this purpose that could be used for this purpose. That's one thing I just wanted everyone to maybe take a, take a just think about it a little bit because once that money goes into the project fund, and I learned something on Tuesday that from you, <laughs> Miss Ellington Graves, uh, that, that, that I, I didn't realize that. I thought it was just a whole bunch of cash that you guys have access to and let's use it, but it's, it's for this purpose, it's for that purpose, it's for this purpose. And the reason I want to be clear is because that once I write you the check, I got no more say so. Now, as for someone who had to work with SEC looking over all the time, that's just something I'm not used to. You always have to be accountable for the funds that you have access to and what you use. So I just wanted to bring that up that, you know, look at the ledger. It's pretty clear 
that if we put it in the project fund, we can't use it for what we need it for. And I don't understand why we would do that to ourselves uh, because we could always take it from the capital reserves at any moment in time and put it in that project fund. Therefore, for the school system, it would alleviate, it would give you more options. Your, your board would have so many different ideas to use that money for because you see firsthand what's happening. I just didn't want to be cubbyholed. Uh, it's sort of, um, in, my, in the back of my head, it's sort of ridiculous to have $5.2 million sitting in my account and I can't use it. Uh, doesn't, doesn't seem like the proper way to go, in my personal opinion. Let me ask Ms. Rawlings, is that proper? Can we do it? Can, can that be done? So the $1.9 million that is the additional money that's coming, we expect to come in this year, is sales tax. It is a restricted by state legislation. So that particular amount of money has to be spent for capital, whether we put it in the reserve or whether we keep it in the general fund. Um, and the school system would be restricted on their side as well. However, the $3.3 million can be funded with property tax or something else. Right now, that is in the manager's recommended budget. That is going to the school system as a, um, as a capital outlay. Mm -hmm. um, and on their end, they would respond and budget it similarly. But there is more flexibility with that 3.3 the way you're, you're indicating that sh it should be. It just seems the proper, you know, more, more efficient way mm -hmm. to take care of your funding. Well, has the, has the school system looked yet on what? I know you've done a lot of work already on security, but are, are there, have you identified additional areas, security needs, and approximate cost, and about what that total might look like? So then Dr. Thorpe's not here tonight, but um, he has, we've been taking it a school zone at a time, right, of, of the proof, you know, putting in the security vestibules, putting in the card access, the right. cameras, uh, and so he does have it um, mapped out, right, what's left, where is it, you know, what it may cost, you know, to get that finished. So there is a, a clear roadmap um, that the system could jump on top of. Well, is the money we're talking about tonight going to cover that or more than cover it or? Sure. 5.2 million. That, you know, it's, you know, I, um, every time I talk to Todd about a bid, it, it's growing. So, um, I know. But, <laughs> but I mean, it would certainly, it would certainly put a dent in it and help us do it sooner rather than having to manage it in chunks like we have. Well, are there think, are there ways to parcel this, parse this out so that perimeter issues, which can keep somebody from getting in, are done first before you try and deal with internal issues like special kind of locking systems on interior doors? Well, I think of what you've described is an appropriate use of, of this dollar, so. Um, and that's up to the school board, not us. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We'd like to point out, as Mr. Carter and I just just said to each other, that's up to the school board. Um, Dr. Butler, you're here. Anything you want to add to this discussion? Uh, yes, I'll start on July 1. <laughs> 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 that was an excellent dodge. Uh, there, yeah. uh, the perimeter of our buildings are uh, essential to cover right now. That's the okay. first point. Um, and just thank you for considering what you're doing already. So uh, we will make it work. Sheriff Johnson and I, I'm sure, can get together, figure out a way to expedite this. It's not going to be easy because I do think there's a shortage. Uh, Chief Long made that very clear the other night. But it's a liability we don't want on, on us, right? So we have to move quickly. So I think uh, Mr. Turner's suggestion about retired uh, police officers, I know the limit is the same with teachers that are working at retirement. There's a limit. We have to be mindful of that, but I still think that's a great way to get this done quickly because you know, we're within a month of really needing this to, mm -hmm. to have a plan on paper. So again, thank you. Uh, the safety of the schools is more than SROs. I've made it clear that that's my priority, having that person in the building. Uh, but I understand what has been talked about since then with the physical plan, and certainly we are paying attention to that. A lot of progress has been made by Dr. Thorpe. Again, I've, I've not seen it all. I've not had time to review it all. My goal is to make that across all 36, soon to be 37 campuses in terms of physical plan security. Thank you. Thank you. I just got one question. It's about the um, our veteran service office. You and I had a discussion today about the van um, 
and I was just curious, did the Veterans Service Office approach you about maybe taking this position that I've pushed, we've all pushed for? Was that to be part of that? Did they ask for that? I would not say that veterans, the Veterans Services Office asked for that. That was um, a suggestion from um, commissioners based on concerns of the community. Okay, so does that mean, is AlcoVets going to be pulling out of that? Because I know they've come before us to talk about, I mean, they've done a great service and they've had a van that they've gotten. And I'm just curious, is this going to be a partnership? Because I know they always call mm -hmm. them, right, to see first if they can. Are they having a hardship with getting drivers to so, save people like so many other places yeah. are? I think the um, I think the intent of this is that that position would coordinate or transport. So I think there are times when Alco Vets is mm -hmm. not able to transport. Right. So I think they would be the first um, people that they reach out to. Um, but I think the the other part of it is you know if it came down to it, you you really don't want this position being. A transport position all the time but they could spend their time helping to coordinate some of it and if you you know if you got desperate then maybe this person could transport but again you know I don't think it I don't think that's the desire is that this person becomes only a van driver I think they really right. want to be able to be in contact with volunteers and those in the community that are willing to serve this purpose okay I know we've talked about ACTA and PART and all that. Um, I don't know many disabled veterans that like to take a van and transfer to another van and have to go anywhere by themselves. I was at the VA hospital for three years with my father. He walked us fine toward the end. I was his consistent advocate. Mm -hmm. And that makes a big difference because you're working with a lot of soldiers. A lot of times we even take the step to get help. We've talked about homelessness and drug addiction and all that and um, sometimes that's the route to get to the VA as a last result when somebody actually gets them there. So I don't want us to think that ACTA is the answer to all our problems or taking someone to another van and then another van. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just don't see that as really, really being um, considerate and passionate, compassion when it comes to this particular vet. Um, because if you go to the VA and sit down there, you're going to see all looks of what war has done mm -hmm. to someone. And to get them there and be accompanied by a family member or an advocate is the real key to do this. So I do have concerns with um, this position because um, this, you, you don't, this is opening a door. And the mm -hmm. fact that we're talking about serving elements County vets first, which I totally agree, but um, I know when my son went in the Army, he didn't have a particular street that he served on or a country. He was all over places, and that was just part of being in the military. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage us to uh, think about stuff like that because if we have a veteran that's not getting served in another county for whatever reason because they ain't near as good as we are here, there's no way we're going to tell, hate it, you're not from here, we don't like your zip code. So um, we need to think big picture, United States of America, because that's who fights our fights for us, not mm -hmm. just one particular person on Main Street. And that's not fussing, that's just, um, I want us to realize that the military's everywhere, and that means so is that veteran. Um, I, I, just, that, I just know that VSO officer is crucial in that because we're looking at DD-214s, DD we're looking at disabilities, they helped my son, but it took a while. I mean, they helped my dad. It took a long time because his records were burned up in a fire. There's all kind of stuff. And to get them to actually come out of the military as a new veteran, that's a whole different ball game, or someone who's really got some serious issues, we need to have staff ready for them. And I sure don't want somebody sitting down with a veteran and then you have a situation where, well, you got to leave in 10 minutes. you got to drive somebody. It's all vital. It's all mm -hmm. important. But um, we've got other areas that can really do that because um, nonprofits that do the grunt work and everything, they fill in all the holes and God bless them. Volunteers could run this country probably a lot better than what's running it. I'm talking about myself. So um, I just, um, I just, like, did, did someone approach the sheriff about a van? Yeah, I did for one. Okay, so was this your idea? I think 
Alamance County taxpayers are paying for veteran services in Alamance County, and I think they need priority. They're paying for it. Our taxes, Alamance County taxes, are paying for Alamance County veterans. I'm not saying that all veterans are not important, because they all are extremely important, but I think we've got to give preference to our taxpayers who are paying for it here, as opposed to adjoining or neighboring or across the state veterans. I think we need to take care of our Alamance County veterans. I agree, and we already do. But in case somebody else has to have some help because they're turned away or it just doesn't work out, I don't think we need to neglect them either. I think every soldier matters, especially the ones living under a bridge or in their car. That's a big deal. And um, so, but that's, um, I just think this position needs to be for that service officer. And then I know different boards have veterans, maybe they have to think about getting involved in their agency. I'd love to drive somebody if they had the nerve to ride with me. So, um, but I just, um, I don't know. I, I just, I just wondered how that happened um, to find out today. So that's all. Can I call the question? One other item, Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I could, please. Um, came to my attention very recently, and I'm not, I haven't had time to do any contacting or investigation, but I was told that DSS is using third-party contractors or third-party providers to do transportation services in lieu of using ACTA, and I wondered why that would, why we would be not using our county transportation service and why, D, why DNS would be paying somebody else when we've got a service right here to do it? So um, I have not had time to research that. I was asked that this afternoon, and I've not had a chance to research. I, I know that. I, I didn't. Get, I didn't call you about that today when I was getting into it. But if you could look into that, I'd, I'd appreciate it. I'll be glad to look at it. I did call her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mentioned it to John earlier, so. Okay. Wait, I've just got one question because I don't know the answer, and you'll help me. <laughs> um, no pressure. Okay, a tax cut. Okay, a penny. That's what, 1.6 million? Mm -hmm. That has to come out of the budget, right? Nope. Okay, well, so it's coming where? It, it can, we can designate where it comes from. I, I can tell you where it is. It's been sitting there for two years. Okay. Well, it can come Wait out of the general fund. Okay. We couldn't can we just take general it out of the general fund. fund, or we could, we could take it out of the, our savings account, where most people put their money when they save it to spend it for a rainy day. Okay. There's several places that money is, and I'll be more than happy to show you that the money that I'm looking at for this one penny tax cut has been sitting there for two years. And we put $14 million in the general fund this now, year. So. And we haven't even got to where we're going to get out of this right. year's budget. So, you know, we're about to put in $25 million in two years that we've been sitting here. We're about, we put in 14 and a half last year, and I'll bet anybody in this room we're going to get 11 and a half this year. That's $25 million. If we can't pony up and give the taxpayer 10% back, and we're not even doing that, then we are doing a disservice to ourselves because that $25 million tells each and every person in this room one thing. We taxed our people too much by $25 million in two years. The money I want to use for the tax cut has been, is, was given to us by the taxpayer 26 months ago. Been sitting in our savings account for two years, just sitting there, drawing interest. Now's a good time to give it back to the taxpayers because inflationary periods of time, people need to know, people need to spend their money the way they choose mm -hmm. rather than somebody like us deciding where it goes. And when you have that much surplus, and I call it a surplus because it's more money than we told the taxpayers we needed. So now's a good time to show them that we have good faith and we understand from our taxpayers that when we sat in this seat, one penny gave us 1.1, and today it's 1.6. That's a 50% increase. The taxpayer should get some benefit from our increased tax base. That's the only reason. I wanted two pennies. I know there's two pennies there, but I understand the reason why we can't get there. I understand it. I hope the taxpayers understand it. Okay, just Where one you, question. I'm, I'm Boy, thank you. You helped me a lot. Since we're so loaded, Yep. Um, Give them more? No. Let's do three. I, I'm thinking about the taxpayer because I'm a taxpayer. We all are. Well, and and I hear Parks and Rec 
talk about what we need to spend to really upgrade our ball fields and upgrade places in our community that are real thriving for community. And like I said, we've had a couple years of COVID that just wiped kids out, their performance, their, their academic things, they're so far behind because of remote. Not every kid scored on that and, and did good. It was just the situation it was. But whenever I, it's like Parks and Recs and you're on that board now, I'm no longer on it, are always asking for something and they're one of the most healthiest rock stars in this county and we always put them over here in the corner. And I think of Sylvan, I think of Beaver Jordan, ah got a snow cone out of that concession stand. It tells you how old it is. And that's a real community thriving positive note to get kids back out on the ball field with their families watching them with what's facing young people this day. And I, I find it hard, tax cuts are fine, I, God bless it, but I find it hard for us to have all of this money and we're, we're looking at the school that kind of thing and they're going to find theirs and we're going to make sure they do because we're going to make sure we do our part. But at the same sense, we just don't have anything to give to this. And you're on that board now. You know what they're looking at. I can tell you what I've done for the Parks and Recreation. Them solely. They're not the only department right. in the county. We, like the school system, we have issues going forward with salaries. Mm -hmm. Okay, we took a giant leap this year. Correct me if I'm wrong, finance ladies. Our salaries for 1,047 people in this county is $51.2 million. We increased our salaries by 10%. We increased it from 51.2 to 56.4. Am I wrong, ladies? About $5 billion. Billion? Million. million. Okay. Five million more. <laughs> now, the reason okay. that that's important is $5,000 went to everybody in the Parks and Recreation Department. Mm -hmm. Increase in their salaries, not just a bonus, not just a one-time thing. They can understand that next year they're going to get that as well. Now, that's not where we stop. That's just where we began. And I truly think that as we go forward and we start to see $11.5 million on a $185 million budget, maybe we, that's a good time to step up on the next level. We can't fund it all at one time. And we certainly can't make our budget in such a way that we're running, you know, really close. Uh, but I do realize that there's some things we have to do. It's just going to take some time. And we've got to be a stair-step kind of an attitude and do a little bit more each and every year. This is what the taxpayers can afford this year. But I certainly don't want to leave them off the hook. I don't want to let the taxpayers sit there and say, why, am I, why, why is my county increasing its tax base, but yet I get no benefit? They keep asking me for the, my money every year. And uh, just to let you know, if you looked at our agenda tonight, uh, the next item on the agenda, I think you're going to want to hear. Because I have some really great ideas about how to increase our funding to whatever department you want. If you want money to go to the Parks and Recreation Department, and that's where I've told the chairman, that's where I'm going to send my tax cut. I'm either going to send it to the sheriff. Let's, let's wait until we get to that. Right, half and half. But what I'm saying is, there are ways that we can do this in which um, you're going to be happy because the taxpayer is going to feel like they're getting the bang for their buck. And people who have a tendency to think that we, um, how do we say this, <laughs> that they don't pay enough taxes or they have, they found uh, $100,000 in the seats of their cushion. They want to, there's a, we're going to set up an avenue for them to, um, but that's the next center. item on our agenda. Yes, sir. Let's wait till we get there. Yes, sir. Let me also point <laughs> out uh, to the school board, as you well know, and I see Mr. Baker sitting here. Uh, a lot of the most of the ball fields that our kids play on aren't county owned. By far, the majority are provided by the school system, uh, by community service, uh, community uh, agencies, and all kinds of things. Uh, so by far the majority of these ball fields are not county operated anyway and we're thankful that the nonprofits, the uh, LMS Burlington School System and many others provide these fields that we use for our county residents. Um, wait, guys? wait, wait. <laughs> um, this is the biggest thing we'll do. It's like hiring a superintendent. Sure. Um, well, Thank you, Bill, for doing that. Well, I, I'm just curious what happens to all this money when people can't afford the prices on houses, gas is going to be off the charts, inflation, debt. You know, sooner or later, 
people's credit cards go to max out, and, oh, and that may change. And I just don't want to cut this instead of being consistent and then have to socket two people in a couple of years like, like it's had to happen before whenever we got a bond for the school. An emotional roller coaster is not fun to be on because you really don't buy a ticket for it. And that's that's all I'm saying. I, I just, um, I'm not I'm not you guys. Y'all are way above my pay grade on stuff like this. I'm just the people person. And I know you are too, but um, I just... You know, I, it's always easy to deflect, well, it's not our ball fields, or it's, it's not our moon, it's not our Mars. It is ours, because it's in this county, and we are all about all taxpayers, you know, and their families. So, to me, it is all of us, because we want SROs, because it's all of us. And uh, we were on fire about this after Uvalde, but you, you better stay on fire about it, and, and don't have it just at a one-time thing to where this is an emergency crisis, because... You watch the news, crisis is all the time. And we've just been really lucky. We just keep counting our, our lucky stars. So just pray to God nothing happens here. But I'm sure everybody that happens said the very same thing. So that's all. I just I just want to thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. Thank you. Call to question. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? No. All right. Four to one. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a 10 minute recess. So, we'll call us back into session. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, we're now on item number 7.2. Citizens Voluntary Fund. Mr. Lashley, you're recognized. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate this. I'm actually uh, quite excited about talking about this because it actually came as an idea from a conversation I had with someone a few weeks ago. Uh, what I wanted to do was to uh, provide an avenue for uh, anyone. Uh, well, we just passed the tax cut. Uh, some I've gotten emails and some folks not really enamored with the tax cut. Don't understand why we want to give a tax cut and said they didn't want it. So I wanted to provide an avenue for anyone. It doesn't have to be just for your tax cut. It can be, like I said, if you find some cash in your, uh, <laughs> in your sofa or you uh, get left some money from your favorite uncle and you want it to go to the county government. I want to set up an account to allow you to fund it unlimitless. There's one catch. You have to designate the department that you want it to go to. For example, if you want it to go to the sheriff's office, if you want it to go to the schools, <laughs> if you want it to go to the parks and recreation, you have to designate that's where you want it to go. And I challenge everyone in Alamance County to uh, help us. This would be a great way to fund the departments that you like. This doesn't normally happen in county government. It doesn't happen in a lot of governments. But I think you should, you know, uh, once again, I said this before, I'm an options guy and I like to have a lot of options. This is a great option for anyone who, like I said, doesn't want the tax cut, wants to donate some money from her favorite uncle, or if you just, you know, want to do like they do on TV where you fund it $11 a month going to give you this opportunity and I hope everyone will take advantage of it. I know I certainly will. Is that a motion? I want to make a motion to we uh, set up uh, the, the citizens advisory, uh, voluntary. Make sure I say it right. Citizens voluntary fund set up. We will uh, designate maybe um, maybe next year this time around budget time. We'll see how much money is in this account and disperse it at that time. But I want to specify it's put for a specific department, not a project. It's for the specific department that you would like to donate it to. I'll second that motion. Thank you. And I'd like to second it as well. That's a great idea. <laughs> uh, That's a third, John. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just beat me to Elementary it. Elementary <laughs> math. That's a third. Oh. Uh, May I amend your motion slightly? That is, it be uh, dispersed annually based on our fiscal budget, which would end on June the 30th. So it would be appropriated uh, the following July. July uh, and then we could have an apportioning 
to that various department uh, and know exactly how much goes to each department um, and let the citizen designate whether they want to be recognized or not. Now, if you want to give money back to the county, I think that's a wonderful idea. Uh, just, would just you that, amend fine. your motion to that? Absolutely, that's Would you amend fine. your second to that? I will, and I'd like to add another amendment to it. Uh, that we might uh, recognize, if the citizen wants to be recognized, that we might recognize them in that July meeting. Sounds good to me. Sounds good. Do you so amend yes, in your second? Well, I might change that to, to, to an August meeting because in mm -hmm. July we usually only have one and it's already going to run kind of long normally, so. You think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just say on a physical budget, uh, which will end June 30, and then we can actually pull the trigger when we're ready. That's true. Sounds good. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. As far as I know, we're the only governmental entity to allow people to give gifts back to the county. And if you think your tax reduction is too high, we welcome it back. <laughs> Mr. Lashley, thank you. Yes, sir. My pleasure. We're going to see how many people give their money back. <laughs> I've got a way to do it now, for sure. Thanks, <laughs> bud. Okay. We recognize Ms. Cattle. She's at a planning and inspection. I am. I would like to say that I have seen Tanya at Food Line and Moscas. So that tells me she does have a life. <laughs> oh. Appreciate it. And I met Mr. Tanya. So yes, she did. <laughs> Mr. Tanya. She met Mr. Tanya. <laughs> and he goes by that, huh? When he's around her, yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like Mr. Pam. It's all Always a pleasure when I see y'all out in public. It does mean that um, we look different in normal clothes, don't we? We all look the same. Talk. Yeah. Tonight, uh, Bruce has already got it queued up for me. I have a short presentation to go over the text amendment for the RV park ordinance. And then, like I said, it's going to be short. So anything that y'all need to know or we need to discuss, give us plenty of time. Uh, front page here is telling you highlighted text or things that were changed by planning board. The strike through text is language that was originally proposed but then removed. The blue bold and italic text or language that has been amended by staff not to change intent from planning board but between legal planning and discussions with individuals and with some of you all. Some of those changes have come about so we want to make sure that that was more visible. I uh, do want to just preface this that we have had our public hearing on this that was done in May and that was duly noticed that was tabled so we're in complete legal order and Patrick will say yes as well that we are in where we need to be uh, first page well, I guess second page for Bruce um, is just we're working on language from the manufactured home park ordinance to say expansion to existing development it says existing manufactured home parks shall be considered legal non-conforming subject to section 3.2 of this ordinance uh, except for section 3.2.3 discontinuation of non-conforming use discontinuation non-conforming use of manufactured home park is governed by 6.7.5 so that's the 3.2 is the entire ordinance and that's governing everything in the county so we wanted to be very specific in the manufactured home parks to be clear on what discontinuation means for that. So 6.7.5 speaks only to manufactured homes, parks. If a non-conforming manufactured home park for any reason discontinue the use of a park for one year, 365 days or more, such use may not resume until permits are obtained and all of the requirements of this ordinance are met. For purposes of this section, discontinued use take takes place when a, not a single habitable manufactured home remains on a lot of a park. In such cases, the entire park would be discontinued and no longer be used as a manufactured home park. The second part of that, the blue language actually has come in legal, modified that just to make sure there was complete clarity there. I guess I'm gonna stop there because that part only applies to itself. Is there anything that we need to discuss with that? No takers. Okay, we're going to move on. 
All right, so next page. Let's get that one more. There we go. So we're going to start with 6.14. This is a whole new section in the Unified Development Ordinance to speak to recreational vehicle travel trailer parks. We have went over this and we're not going to go word by word, but you've got 2,400 square foot lot size. Your road standards on the next page are 60 foot right away. Wanted to make sure we completely understand why that's a 60 foot, not a 50 foot that's in the manufactured home park section. And that is simply because when fire marshal comes in and they do the reviews of these, if planning puts 50 foot on there, it really doesn't matter because fire marshal has regulations that the state gives them and they need a 26 foot travel surface for most anything that's got any, any link to it. So it requires a 60 foot right away. So that language is really there just to be sure that planning and fire marshal are not conflicting each other not really just because planning wants to do it but uh, it's come up multiple times in development so we want to make sure that we kind of get us started on the right foot there um, next page is where we've got some uh, added language after discussions from uh, the board and citizens and things legal and myself went in and made some changes to this and it says uh, landscape buffers you'll see at the bottom we have struck through the existing language and now it says if any portion of any park is both within a thousand feet and visible from any schools, churches, or residences, residences other than the park owner, then the park owner will be required to install additional screening from view with a buffer strip or screen fence along the boundary line facing the residence. For purpose of this ordinance, a screen fence must be at least six feet high and of opaque material. Please see Appendix B for suggestions and guidance on the general screening. The buffer requirement may also be satisfied by existing natural vegetation meeting the intent of this ordinance, provided that the natural vegetation is owned by the park owner. Whether to install a screen fence or landscaping buffer to meet this requirement is up to the park owner. It's not up to staff or anything. Uh, when we speak of existing vegetation, we do go out and do site visits on these. We would rather have existing vegetation than new plants to wait for them to get to maturity to serve their purpose. So we always want to keep that language in there for great for them and for neighbors. Uh, next page talks about screening and it gets down to uh, the buffer requirement may be satisfied by a screen fence defined at least six feet in height and made of opaque material. Um, and then we scratch out as defined by the ordinance. Just giving some options to people, especially if you've got some kind of steep slope or contour that landscaping really isn't going to work for, a fence is usually a viable option in those situations. Um, next page takes us to what we've heard about as land spacing. Uh, we use land spacing in the heavy industry ordinance. Uh, we de dealt a lot with that when we were rewriting. Uh, this section we have modified still to meet the intent of what planning board wanted, but to clarify some language uh, just for interpretation purposes. Uh, land spacing and protected facilities uses regulated by this section shall be required to meet a minimum spacing requirement for any protected facility as defined by this section. Land use spacing shall be measured in a straight line without regard for intervening structures or objects from the closest edge of the property line of the tract on which the RV park is located to the nearest improvement currently in use as a protected facility. The purpose of this requirement is to minimize potential negative impacts of conflicting land uses. For the purpose of this section, the following shall be considered protective facilities. A religious facility, a manufactured home park, a recreational vehicle travel trailer park, a public or privately owned park or playground, a school, and a dwelling unit. Uh, we have scratched the other language. This actually is very, very similar to what we did in the heavy industry, almost verbatim for language, so that we can have some continuity in our ordinance. Uh, the bottom part of this page speaks of an exception. An exception in RV park may be located in any direction from the residence of the owner of the RV park. The following are land spacing requirements for recreational vehicle park defined by the number of units. Land spacing requirements are to be measured from the property line of the RV park to the neighboring property structure as defined below. So we didn't change the land spacing pieces um, for this vision. But we did add in underneath that where strict application of these standards are not achievable, the planning director may consider requiring a five feet tall landscaping firm. The firm must be maintained a minimum of three one slope ratio. The required landscaping for the park shall be planted atop the berm to meet the requirement of this ordinance. 
So I know there's been some discussion. Uh, the planning department is not there to approve this. This is actually given the landowner and the developer the option of putting in a berm as opposed to having to meet the land spacing. Um, may consider, okay, it doesn't, okay. It doesn't really say may, but in any case, uh, I can. I think you can interpret that to mean that they have that as an option. I don't think if we if we need some different wording, that's okay. But that's the intent is to allow the developer to make that decision. No, it says may. Mm -hmm. So they oh, don't okay. have to build. Well, it mountain. says the director may consider. They don't have to. They, they can do the land spacing. It's several discussed options, and this is one of the options that want to be looked at. So we drafted some language for that so that it wasn't strictly the hunter. The 150 foot land spacing was the concern. Mr. Scott? Sir? Does the, does the way that's worded give the um, developer the option of making the decision to use a berm versus the planning department or not? It could be clear. We can add that. Make modifications to it. Good point. Okay. The gentleman, um, I think it was Mr. Prevett was talking mm -hmm. about 26 feet to 24 feet. I think that was the width of the street. What was what were you talking about? Yeah, street, street okay. Good. What what's the deal with that? Okay, Please. so what he's talking about is travel surface. Okay. Um, he is correct that fire marshal, depending on road lengths and turnarounds and things like that, road widths change. But 26 foot travel surface is what is mandated right now for general road purposes. If you have a shorter road, you can go as narrow as 20 foot on your travel surface. The right of way is there for your travel surface and your drainage, including your um, trenches and your ditches and everything to make sure your stormwater runoff is there. So that 60 foot of right of way holds that 26 foot road. If you go down to a 20 foot road, you only need a 50 foot right of way to get all that built in there. Continue, yes, sir. So we're going to skip through a couple things here, and we're going to go to page 127, and that is 6.14.4. There we go. So this is expansion to existing development. There needed to be some clarity here. So existing RV or travel trailer parks, which are approved under the prior manufactured home parks ordinance shall be considered legal non-conforming subject to section 3.2 of this ordinance. So we had a couple that we approved underneath there and legal want to make sure that we didn't lose them and they fall in some kind of gap for us. Um, next page is page 147 and that actually takes out the light duty truck definition and that was done by planning board and that matters actually further back in our um, definition. So if we skip over to the next page for a manufactured home when we're right now our ordinance allows for manufactured homes and RVs to be in the same mobile home park together so in order to separate those out we're actually just adding one word and um, it's saying travel trailers campers or motor homes or any other transportable structure with or without permanent foundation being used as a residence within an approved mobile home park shall not be considered a manufactured home travel trailers campers and motor homes being stored on the site and not as a resident shall be considered manufactured homes. So we're just trying to distinguish and separate those out in that definition. Uh, the next page actually brings up your definition of recreational vehicle, RV, travel trailer. And this is a vehicle which A, is built on a single chassis, B, is 400 square feet or less when measured at the largest horizontal projection, C, designed to be self-propelled or permanently towable, D, on the next page is designed primarily not for use as permanent dwelling but as temporary living quarters for recreation camping travel or seasonal use and is fully licensed and ready to ready for highway use uh, tiny homes and park models that do not meet the item listed above are not considered recreational vehicles and shall meet the standards of and be permitted as residential structure and then you have recreational vehicle travel trailer park as related to a park comprised of three or more recreational vehicles rvs or travel trailers on one tract of land regardless of whether or not a fee is being charged to occupy the land 
And then you have recreational vehicle, RV, travel trailer, park space, and that's the portion of the land in recreational vehicle, travel trailer, park allotted to or designed for accommodation of one res recreation vehicle, travel trailer. And that's to, just so we can get them drawn up when we um, get those new plans in. Well, I unfortunately have to say this is the end of the line, so that's all I have to say tonight. <laughs> Mr. Turner, you have going through this extensively I don't know about that, and but. with me so <laughs> would you um, comment well I have some questions um, Mr. Title, I'd like to start with the land spacing mm -hmm. um, what page, what page? Uh, um. 7.3 point a all right a couple scenarios let's say I have um, there are two pieces of property one's due north of the other there's a line that separates them running due east and west. Okay, and I gotta, I wanna put an RV park on the northern side and it's 10 acres. Okay. I wanna put 15 RVs. Okay, so I'm in the 150 foot land spacing area. Okay. Uh, and let's say I've got a line of houses on the southern part along the entire length of the, of the boundary, okay. 100, 100 feet in. 100 feet in, okay. Oh, 100, sorry, 100 feet off the, off the boundary. All right. Okay. 10 feet, I'm sorry, a 10 acre parcel north of that, where can I put RVs? So, in order to meet the 150 foot land spacing, the only way you could place RVs there would be to take and put this berm in for the length of that property line so that you have an option on the land spacing or else travel trailers could be put on that piece, on that section of the line. So you'd have to put a, you'd have to put that berm That's the along the entire the only other option is if there's something crazy with the land that causes a situation where they could apply for a variance by state law. Okay. So, I mean, if you were just, re if you didn't want to put a berm in, it was too expensive, and you were just relying on the land spacing statute or the landscaping language, you, you couldn't put RVs. Yeah, unless you found a reason for a variance. Yeah. All right, let's change it. Let's suppose, um, same scenario, okay, but I'm in the, I want to put eight RVs on the northern part, so I'm in the 50 okay. foot land spacing requirement mm -hmm. and I've got a row of houses that are 45 feet south of the border mm. where can I put RVs on my you're my in board? the same situation same so you're either berming or you're asking for a variance yeah okay all right let's uh, let's talk about land um, escape buffers all right all right let's say um, same situation I've got one home that is 500 feet south of the line um, but I can, but from that home, I can see the RV park. So I'm in my thousand foot landscaping mm -hmm. buffer. I got to put a fence along my whole southern boundary, right? From wherever it's visible. Visible is what we're looking at here. So if it's still visible from the whole boundary, absolutely. Right. Okay. Just from just one house, I'll fence the entire 10 acre. Right, as it, I mean, it says both within a thousand feet and visible, so you're qualifying both pieces. Mm -hmm. um, the way the ordinance is written, uh, I'm still in the landscaping buffer. Mm -hmm. uh, let's assume that between those two parcels, there's a there's a road, a uh, state main. Let's say it's Highway 87. Okay. Um, do I have to still meet the landscaping buffer requirements, even though my my RV park is is I'm sorry. So there are houses, same situation. There are houses in the south <coughs> part. There's a road that goes between them. It's Highway 87, and I've got an RV park I want to put on 10 acres to the north. Do I have to abide by the thousand foot landscaping buffer requirement? As it's written, yes. It doesn't speak to you're skipping the road, and the road is already there, so you can't. Well, let me, let me stop. You've got the road there. Nothing in the ordinance says that the roads accept you from these rules. The rule stands with no exception. So right now there are no exceptions to that. So if it was still within that, you'd still have to do it. Okay, thank you. Got a question about the point raised on the road frontage mm -hmm. and visibility to the park. Somebody turning around, <laughs> trying to have to get back to the park, something of that nature. Um, there's no prohibition on signage that would identify the park at the entrance, correct? 
We have no sign regulations in Alamance yeah, County, right. so if it was bright neon with fireworks shooting, well, fireworks shooting, you have to get from it. But with light. anything else shooting out of it, you could do it. You would want to stay out of DOT's right away unless you want to get a permit from them, but that would be your only caveat. We don't have any regulations for signs. So nothing prohibits a sign at the entrance next to the road to show where the park is. That's what I thought. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, it just seems like there's so many more little picky things that we're putting on this certain thing. That's just, just from hearing it on the outside. When we're talking about these berms, these little hills, because I'm hearing like if I've got this house, I basically don't need to see this RV park. Is that what I'm, is that what Well, I think is? we need to see it both ways. Right that we're a rural county, an agricultural county. Um, can you show me the last line? This will kind of bring this home for me. Okay. Um, there we go. So this is a map. You've got the same 20 acre piece of park land. Mm -hmm. Map on the left side is if you did 30,000 square foot lot, minimum lot size for single family development. We didn't put any roads in here. That's usually 10 to 15%, but I wasn't gonna design on this one, so I just maxed it out. And that's 29 single family lots, right? Typical subdivision. On the right side, you have the same 20 acres, but you got your 2,400 square foot lot because that's what this ordinance allows for. You get 120 recreational vehicles okay. in there. So from a planning perspective, these are two very different densities and two very different land uses. We don't have a way of saying where something can go in the county and where it shouldn't go. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of some of these guidelines is to say two very different uses. Let's put a farm on that left side, the big piece of property there. So either one, you would want to buffer those uses. You don't want the people in the RV park bothered by the farm use at six o'clock in the morning. And you don't want the farm bothered by the kids in the RV park riding the cows, right? So you don't want that to, exactly. Uh, you don't want those to cross up. So from a planning perspective, you have two different land uses and the best way to do noise, visual and sound buffering comes with landscaping and then separating them of distance from each other so they get less and less interactive with each other and less nuisance. You know, we've got some things down east where farmers were there, subdivisions moved in later, lawsuits happened, farmers got run out of business because the other piece, the new people came in and their uses seem to be more important. We don't want that here. We like to keep our agriculture. So when the planning board talked about all these things these were all on their mind when they came up with this that they want to keep the heritage here but they also want to allow these size lots they wouldn't put them in there otherwise but they want to make if you're going to reduce the lot size and allow a good density we got to complement that with some buffers because they're very different than anything else the county has okay when when we're out in the community riding around because there's so many mobile home parks sure. and not all mobile home parks are pretty it just depends on who's got them and how they feel about taking care of them. Um, what happens to the person that lives beside that mobile home park that is just, it, it's just a mess? I mean, I don't mean that to be disrespectful, but everything looks different depending on who's got control of it, how they want it to appear, the regulations they have, mm -hmm. they mow their yard, just all kind of simple things like that. So what happens with, with that? We, don't, we can't do anything to that, right? That's like well, we could, yesterday. We, we could write some language to retro some of that aesthetic piece in. Um, I think that was attempted here and got some bad negative feedback and was abandoned and only went with the non-conforming, trying to get them where they have more time to put mobile homes in there. But we can do that through planning. It's just a matter of do we want to do yeah. that. Well, I feel like if we're going to have strict regulations for this, because I know it's kind of fairly new, it's the new thing, mm -hmm. so to speak, and it serves a good purpose, it really does. I think we need to have the same standards for everybody, because um, there's a place out on Highway 87 South that's uh, a cousin to a certain street that I dealt with in Burlington, Tony. And, uh, and behind that certain place, Tony, is looks like a cousin to it because it's a, it's a mess too. There's a few All, of those in the case. There's a bunch of them. All I'm saying is whatever is wrote in stone for Alamance County, it has got to be enforced because we can't pick this one to do this and not that one. And I mean, we're going to be measuring noises, right? So we're going to have to be, we're going to, I mean, this, I just think the standard needs to be high if that's what we want for our county. And um, 
but I don't want to pick and choose who's better or who's not. I agree. And I know you do. I absolutely know that. So I'm just, I just want us to really think about um, if we're going to have trash heaps and they're going to be acceptable, then we'll write a ordinance, 7B, you can have your trash heap. But, you know, that can go with anything. It's all about a principle and the standard of so. So that, that's just, um, I, I don't see going down this road and, oh, and then something brand new that really looks good. I just I think our standards need to be really high and expected of all of us, preaching to myself. I think we've developed some of these problems over time. And yeah. when some of these mobile home parks were brought in well before even what was our manufactured home park ordinance, those problems have been developed and we're going to have to develop something to resolve those problems. Yeah. I agree because I mean I, I grew up in a mobile home trailer I love the way their <coughs> RVs and tiny homes have their own new name they're just a midget mobile home so you don't need to get over a column of different things like it's gonna make it different because if you put it on wheels it's mobile so um, just just saying that's all I've got a question about your example um, mm -hmm. two 20 acre plots um, and you've got 120 recreational vehicle lots on that second one. Does that take into consideration the buffering? This is no Set buffering back. for either one. This That's is septic tanks okay. in units. So for 14,000 square feet, you can put three RVs in. So for every half acre, you can put three RVs. But it takes you two thirds of an acre to put a house in. But saying that doesn't mean the same thing as when we put it on that. So GIS helped me. Right. And, uh, gives you a visual. <sighs> well, I do still have a problem with being able to find a businessman's business. I certainly don't want us to do something to prohibit that. Um, a sign, and if you've got to, <laughs> if you've got to put. A barrier all the way across the front of the property and all you've got is the opening and a sign you know we, we I guarantee there's gonna be one that's gonna be developed right on the other side of a hill someplace so when somebody comes over that hill there it is and they don't see it because of the buffers we really have the two that we have in have a little bit of that going on and okay. they put some signs in and things and I think Google has recognized them now so Google finds them even in the dark but cool just depends and of course we don't regulate Google but um, the signage thing is something that truly helps and um, they can be whatever they need it to be lit not lit whatever they want to do but what's it camp campground <laughs> USA is that the one that puts up the huge flags on their property you can see it from miles away I don't have a flag regulation either that's right. <laughs> no, no, you put whatever one you want up. You put feather flags up if you like. Two more questions, Mr. Yes, sir. Uh, Ms. Cattle, what's the rationale for having both a landscape buffer at 30 feet and a property line setback 50 feet, so an additional 20? So you got 30 feet to put the landscaping in. That's double rows of trees, and they alternate. They stagger back and forth. And that inevitably at maturity those are going to be taller and almost create a hedge a solid hedge when you put those two together then you've got an additional 20 feet before you get to your first lot per se where you put your rv that allows you to maintain that uh, landscape buffer and to do anything that because these rv spots are quite small so you could literally have an rv up to that line so it gives you as a property owner and developer the right to be able to go back and maintain, get some of your septic systems, that kind of thing, to give you that 20 feet without having your RVs parked right up against your landscape buffer or pushing into it. Are they could, Excuse me. Uh, could you have the same maintenance <coughs> with uh, a 10 foot buffer? So a 40 foot setback? A 40 foot setback, I, I think you could manage that. Of course, it's not gonna be as easy depending on what type of equipment you need to get back there. 10 foot may not be enough. If you need to pull a tree and plant a new one, because you got to keep your trees planted and they can't die off on you or whatever. So, 10 foot may be tight to do something like that. Um, if you got a tracker and a bush hog, that could get tight. Yeah. What's the. Um, so, if I've got two rows, uh, essentially a hedge of, of two evergreen trees, what's the rationale for, for having an additional screening that's an opaque fence if, if, I'm, if I'm coming into the 1,000 foot issue? So the thousand foot issue could be because you've got some variation in land, one's high, one's low, and that fencing go ahead and seals that visual. The landscaping does, 
visual sometimes smell and definitely sound more than a fence would do so you're adding to something that's to double protect it on that thousand foot but the trees are going to be higher than six feet anyway at Eventually. some point yes not at initial planning last thing is um what about mr Provet's point that if if along if the edge of the property that's along a road what's the requirement for having a buffer there uh, I, I mean i can sort of see if i'm if I have adjacent property property owners, but if I'm if I'm facing a road, why do I need a landscaping? Well, that's two point. That can be a safety issue. DOT encourages us to put landscaping should someone come off the road, they're not in a unit or in a house or in something. And on the other side of that, the people that are staying there get a sound and visual from the people on the road. So it kind of plays two parts there. I actually did not remember that. Uh, not gonna like this. Not gonna like this at all. Um, <clears throat> first question I have is it came out of nowhere, and I want to I want to find out where it came from. Huh. Where did the playground show up? We've been talking about this for six weeks, and no one's ever mentioned a playground, yeah, but I yet now that. a playground comes into play. Why is that? I mean, it, like taking Miss Thompson's question, it seems like that uh, you she trying to. It seems like the planning department is actually trying to throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. I mean, just making up things just to make yourself feel right don't make me feel good. That's my first question. I got like 10 more. <laughs> okay, so that was during discussion today, and it was community parks shared by community and playgrounds was stricken at any public or privately owned park or playground. So that was kind of an initial so language that came through. So it's not there anymore. Well, no, that we only struck that part to restructure, but the playground was in the um, so first part. So the playground's part. Still, still viable? Yes. As having to be, you're going to have to dictate a playground. Um, how many feet are in a mile? It's a little over 5,000 feet. 5,280 feet. Yeah. So you're asking for basically one-fifth of a mile is a buffer, 1,000 feet. Any idea how much 1,000 feet costs in a private plan or in, on the farm, this farmland? Yeah, how many 1,000 feet costs? So I think our planning board was looking at that, but they didn't come up or put a number out there when they were talking about Maybe it. Maybe she should ask the planning board to put a number on it. They need to know how much a thousand feet cost these men. These men are trying to run a business. This thing right here you should throw in the garbage. It tells us nothing. How many RV how many P, how many 120 recreational vehicles are gonna be in that lot twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, three hundred and sixty five days a year? Well, so I think planning board decided they don't really have control over that number if all were full at the same time is what they were considering. So in essence we can both agree that the one on the right is going to be very it's not going to have 120 vehicles that's the max that, you that is have. the max that's what's there but it yes. will probably never happen it will probably never happen 120 vehicles will never be in there at one time can we that's kind of that? where i was going bill can we agree to that so if the ones that we have already on record so tell us that they're 98 to 99 percent full all the time so that's the numbers that planning board was working with but it's, it's seasonal you're not going to have you're probably not going to have 120 vehicles in a dead of winter if you're in the southern part of the country just, Maybe. I'm, I'm just saying it's your apples and oranges because it's um it's easy to say the 20 acres 29 <coughs> single family homes yeah because they're stationary they're never moving they're not going to be a, in out this Friday and back out on Sunday it's always going to be changing Transient. always changing that's right. so um, I, I think that's not very helpful to be quite frank with you um, can we agree that a thousand feet is too much 300 it should be closer to three 300 feet the length of a football field so planning board did some measurements on some of the existing parts and that's how they came up with the thousand feet where they were comfortable there was a pretty lengthy discussion at planning board over a couple meetings over the distance piece that thousand feet in the land spacing okay um, you know um, out at the place that um, I think mr. Morgan knows um, no, excuse me <coughs> I think it's Mr. Prevet's land. Swepsonville, Sachs, that's yours. You know, right across the street, <coughs> right across the street. You got houses that are 50 feet from the road. If it's good enough for the houses, why isn't it good enough for him? Is it all because of just the just the the scenery? You want the you want the RV park to look not like an RV park? Is that what the goal is? Well, so planning board felt like RV parks were much more dense, and the density 
brings in traffic, brings in noise and things, and vice versa. If they're going, if they're a piece of property out in the rural part that they've got their own conflict with, even farmers doing their thing, so they wanted to do a distance to protect the differences. Uh, Sheriff, what's the, uh, what's the, what's the um, how do I ask this question? Is there a curfew in the county? There's not a curfew. So you can play your music 2 a.m. if you want in the county. I would be willing to bet that if you ask these two gentlemen here, their RV parks are not that way. The RV parks actually have a time frame that when they the curfew comes up at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock or whatever it is, I don't know what it is, guys. You can tell me. Our son is around now. There you go. So therefore, having this worrisome, oh, you know, the, the, the children are going to make noise or the folks are going to make noise, these folks actually have it that when you come into the RV park, there's no noise after 10 o'clock. So that's actually going to help a subdivision that's over here because in this case, the subdivision could be making all crazy kinds of noises, but the RV park's not. Because if you do it in the RV park, I am assuming these two gentlemen would ask someone to leave. So I'm just saying, take that in consideration. The planning board should not be so stringent and should understand, maybe talk to these men and find out what exactly rules they have for the RV park. Because I do believe the RV, RV park has to be looked at differently than mobile home park. The reason being, a mobile home park, those, those mobile homes are going to be stationary for quite a bit of time. Mm -hmm. RV parks are not. Now, granted, there may be extra traffic coming in and out. Understood. Understood. But I think that some of the things that you're asking them to change the uh, from 24 feet, when I think Mr. Br Mr. Brevet said tonight that you know, the regular street outside is only 11 feet. So they're actually, you know, doing more. They're actually doing two feet more than, than, than he would be required to have on a regular street. Uh, I just don't want these gentlemen to be treated in a different way just so the planning department can feel good about themselves. I just want you to understand. I ask you a couple of questions that the planning board needs to answer. You need to tell the planning board. They need to know how much they're going to impact the business owner when they ask for a 1,000 feet. How much does a 1,000 feet cost? That would be, everybody in this room would like to know. Because once again, it looks like they're being singled out. They're just trying to run a business, and they're doing it in the county. Am I right, gentlemen? In the county, where there's no zone. But yet, where our planning board is going to tell them that they're going to have to spend all this money to be dictated <coughs> to from the planning department. That's not what the planning department was designed for. I appreciate the fact that you guys went through this in, in a very lethargic way. But some of the things that you have asked these men to do is completely unacceptable. I mean, it's just not the way you want to go about running a business. And these guys, this is the third time they've been here uh, trying to answer to the planning department. I think the planning department has asked them for too much, just way too much. Uh, and I think that the planning department should actually answer some of the questions I have. I'd be like, I'd like to know if they've been out to Mr. Morgan's place or Mr. Prevett's place to find out how much a thousand foot is going to cost him. I know they've had discussions with each of them. I believe they have visited their parts, but they would have to speak to that more personally. Well, the, the playground is what really just really just got my blood pressure up. It's like gee whiz. Now you want to talk about playgrounds? Uh, a thousand feet. It should probably be 300. Like I said, 300 feet is the length of a football field. That's a long ways. That's a long ways. Even if your house is on the other side, that's a football football field away. And, and I just really want the planning board to, to take in consideration that these people are just like them, and they are trying to run a business. And I can honestly tell you that the two gentlemen that we've had in front here tonight are not going to run a business that's not going to help them out, that's not going to... They don't want to run a business. They don't want to have an RV park that looks like crap. Who's going to come stay there? They want the RV park to look pristine. They want people to feel like it's welcoming. And they also want to think that they've been treated fairly. And I just want you to just, once again, ask the uh, planning department to take in consideration when they ask for these things. You know, uh, and maybe, maybe me as a numbers guy takes this way too seriously, but I would like to know how much is a thousand feet going to cost this guy? Because that's a thousand feet that he can't do anything with. He's got to have to put some bushes or some trees up, and it doesn't help his business out. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Well, let me ask a question. Um, these two gentlemen. Uh, Can I move up here because I can't hear you? No. Please. <coughs> if I had an RV, 
and I'm coming to your park for a weekend, a week, whatever it is, what am I required to show you before I can pull that unit on your lot? You can ID your plastic, your VIN number for your lot, VIN number of the camper. And if we rent you, if we do a, a more than a month, a month to month thing for like people that's working here, we run their credit, their background, and their rental history on, <coughs> on that. We do a national credit check with anybody that's going to stay a month. Let's say I'm staying overnight, or I say a weekend. Uh, I've got to at least show a picture to ID. Is that correct? I don't know who you are and what you're yeah. with. So I can't just check in, do some mischief, and then leave and be unknown. You're going to know who I am. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. All right. So I just want to make sure that this is not a, because I had someone ask me that question. Right. Um, hey, can somebody check in for a couple of nights, uh, rob whatever, and then leave and be unknown? You're going to know who they are. Is that I correct? Know who they are. <coughs> All right. Um, any other questions? I'm no, no. Uh, thank you, Tony. I appreciate it. Bill, uh, make one, a couple of comments here. One, um, the planning board makes a recommendation, so the buck actually stops right here. So, right. but I'm just trying to get them to focus a little bit. I know, and on, I'm just on, saying on what they're we're, asking. We're the ones making that decision. So, if we want to change these things, we need to send it back with some clear. I mean, this has been being kicked around for a long time, so we Since really August, need to. Yeah. We need to to make some clear indications of what we think we want so that we can get something that works. Um, and and the other side of that equation too is, uh, like everything else, all RV parks aren't created equally. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you guys run a clean park, want it right? Everybody's not gonna adhere to that. So we, we've gotta have some regulations. Uh, we've gotta find out what they need to be. But we, I think we need to give the planning department, instead of kicking it back and saying start over, we need to give the planning planning department some clear indications of where we want to go from here. Mr. Carter, let me, uh, I'm not trying to interrupt you at all. But, I'm done. Uh, at the same time, uh, we put these folks off month after I month know. after month. We're right in the middle of prime camping time and rental time for them. And Mr. Turner, I think you have some suggestions that we talked about, you and I talked about earlier, that I can certainly live with and I think some of these folks can live with. Would you mind pointing those out? Before you do that, Craig, I would like for Mr. Prevett to tell this board what he told me today about the trouble he went to for an area he's looking at as far as to really take care of something about the, the, the place. I'm bought I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I think this yeah, is real important about your commitment. I bought some land on Paul Road Feb this past February was a year ago. And any of you that know, I'm sure the sheriff knows where Clark Road and Davis Road are. Yes. There was a terrible, terrible pile of trash on the road. The guy used to have my mobile home there, I understand. I don't even own that little sliver, and I cleaned it up because it's such an eyesore. I don't know how many truckloads we hauled off, and I didn't. I don't even own it. That's the pride that I would take, and I'm sure Mr. Morgan takes in his properties. Well, you have to advertise your property to r attract people to it. I mean, you're I not right out on Interstate 8540, so. I was going to say that if you want repeat business, you better have it nice and clean. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I appreciate that, because okay. that says a lot about your character. Absolutely. And we're up for inspection, too. On the we are up for inspection. I mean, if... You don't make a lot of noise, do you? Because he'll have to come down there and check your noise. <laughs> <laughs> well, our other RV park, Sheriff, the deputies, I've never seen the sheriff out there, but the deputies come through and they say they're glad we took it, but we cleaned it out. And you know, about wishing a little more high park there. Yes, right. Well, that's all we want. We just and want we, really good people in Alamance County because we are really good people. We converted that into an RV park under the old the mobile home park rules and that place is so quiet in Murphy years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it is just, maybe I should move out there. It's, 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 it's I'm tired of living in a deck we, we try to take problems and make it That's it. Mr. Turner. Uh, I'll, I'll right take now. a stab at this Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I think the recommendations from Mr. Morgan and Mr. Prevett are reasonable. 
Um, I do have some concerns that if the if the setbacks are 30 feet and the and the berm has to not the berm but the buffer is 30 feet, there's no way to maintain it. I think 40 feet 40 foot setback is reasonable. Gives you 10 feet to. Space around. Adjust the yeah, adjust the, the buffer. So I, I, I would I'd make a motion that we accept the RV the changes to the RV ordinance with the following exceptions. First of all, I would think that RV park is defined as four units or more rather than three. How many? Four. Four units or more. Uh, that the property line setback be. 40 feet instead of 50. That the landscaping buffer be 300 feet instead of 1,000. Provided, however, that landscaping buffer is not required for the affected uses that are across a public thoroughfare. That the land spacing requirement be 50 feet for all uses. And the travel way is... By all uses, you mean numbers of units. Correct. That the language regarding the berm read, where strict application of these standards are not achievable, the RV park owner may, at his or her discretion, Implement a five foot tall landscaping berm. How tall? Uh, five, five feet. And the rest remain the same. The rest of that section remain the same. So that it's clear that it's it, it's up to the developer, him or herself. And that the travel way be 24 feet instead of 26 feet. Second. Let me be clear on one thing the 26 feet doesn't have anything to do with the fire marshal's office yes sir. it does so we can put in here but our marshal if he has to review it and get involved it could but 24 feet would suffice 26 is the 26 feet is what the fire marshal depends on the things as well I mean, if the fire marshal requires 26 feet, then I'd amend it to be 26 feet. If fire not, then not here, correct? He, he went to a structure fire. No, Sorry. Not <laughs> Sorry. All right. We could put 24. That would be our minimum, but instead of they step in, it could go up. Depending well, on the fire marshal requires 26. That's what it would be anyway. Is that correct? Yeah, because the lengths of the roads matter, and then cul de sacs and things. We don't speak to and hear about all of that comes in public with them. So that means we wouldn't have to come back and do this again. Right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my motion stands. I think that's great. All right. Good. And we have a second, yes, Mr. Lashley. Uh, You're leaving it at 24. 20, 24. 24. Yeah. You're going for 24. 24. Yeah. 24. If this trumped by another another ordinance, then it's trumped. Okay. I agree. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's oh, unanimous. Just one thing, if we can modify that to include the consistency statement that's in your packet. And are we taking a vote on all text amendment or just the RV park? Because we have definitions and all that in this text amendment, just for clarity. It was as written. All of it, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Craig, you said as and written. The as written, yes. Yeah. The, the entire the consistency yes I show what should I do with the consistency I, I wish to be consistent how would you like <laughs> to be consistent are <laughs> <laughs> so you mean the consistency over there <laughs> can he just recognize the consistency statement is that good enough if we can have another motion to include that that would be great um, so I make another motion that uh, that, that we find that the proposed amendments to the Alamance County Unified Development Ordinance are consistent with the Alamance County Land Development Plan as adopted. Specifically, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners finds that the Alamance County Land Development Plan directs the county, one, to promote flexibility in development ordinances, and two, to develop 
conscious strategies for proactively managing the type of growth that is consistent with the county's overall vision and goals. Furthermore, the Board of Commissioners finds that the proposed amendments are necessary to remove ambiguous and conflicting language within the existing ordinance. Therefore, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners recommends approval of the proposed amendments to the county unified development ordinance, period. Thank you, sir. Second to everything he just said. <laughs> Do we second it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. Any further discussion? There being none. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you, Tom. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Um, Ms. Hook, I think you're next. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, commissioners, I am before you tonight to ask that you um, look at um, approving a, and I'm sorry, approving a contract for design services for the bank building that we purchased for the Board of Elections. So we put out a request for design services and RFQ back. Um, earlier in the year, it was closed on April 20th. There were six firms that responded and asked for um, information to be sent back to uh, sent to them. Only four of those responded back to us. We looked at those recommend uh, recommend our we looked at those responses and R and D Associates was the recommended um, architect firm. R&D architects will provide design services, bid services. They're going to prepare construction documents, review bids, and provide construction administration and oversight. That contract is for $83,810. So I'm asking tonight that the Board of Commissioners consider approval of the contract for these services, authorize me as interim county manager to execute the next necessary documents, and amend the budget to use capital reserves for the um, $83,810. Would that be done before um, Ms. York comes on board? The contract will be executed before she comes on board, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Thompson? Where are they from? Are they local? Or? They are in, I think they are out of Durham, and okay. they have actually done several projects for Alamance County government. Great. Any Motion other, to approve. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you. It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Um, budget year end. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. It is hard to believe that we are almost upon June 30th. This fiscal year has flown by. Um, but before you tonight, I bring our annual um, year-end budget revisions. I am asking for approval for us to amend our budget. $375,000 for Alamance Burlington School System fines and forfeitures. This would be using pass-through revenues to budget an additional $110,000 for the NCVTS fees that are supported through tax revenues that have been collected by the North Carolina Department of Motor Vehicles for our motor vehicles. Those are things for overhead costs as far as um, credit card fees and things of that nature. Budget an additional $55,000 for juvenile detention days due to raise the age legislation. Budget an additional $609,705 for EMS operations, which would be supported by our ambulance cost settlement revenues. Transfer $800,000 between detention and sheriff for department operations. Transfer $2,500 for merit increases to purchasing and veteran services. And to allow for um, two transfer between funds, one of those being for $24,921.05 to our emergency telephone uh, service for ineligible expenses. Like I said, this would also allow for the funds to be reported in our emergency telephone system. And our last request is to budget an additional $1.9 million of restricted sales tax revenue that would be transferred to the school's capital reserve fund. The amount that I want everyone to remember is that we would only transfer what is actually received. This would just give us that allowance of up to an additional 1.9, and this would also allow for a transfer in to our capital 
reserve fund. And that last item is the items that we talked about earlier yes. with our budget. First one is too, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Right. And okay. one other thing that this um, that we are asking for um, permission for is each year after we have received our final um, June distributions for tax, then we are able to go back and amend our budget for fire and municipality taxes that have actually been received. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Unanimous. Okay. County manager. Um, you have in your packet the um, fiscal update, and that is all I have tonight. All right. I have a question. You Imagine have that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's a Miss Ethics. Yes, sir. Um, looking at interest rates. Mm -hmm. Are we actively pursuing our short-term levels? Uh, can you give me? I would love to. Um, so just keep in mind that what we are seeing right now are we are having maturities from right. investments that we made With nine low. months yeah. ago um, where we were earning, if possible, 10 basis points. That's right. Um, now we are able to secure commercial paper purchases upwards of almost 3%. So I feel that in the next fiscal year, we'll start seeing that number increase dramatically from where we are right now. Um, so yes, we are actively seeking those. Are you going to, uh, what kind of terms are you looking for? 6, 12, 18? So I set it up on kind of a rolling. Very um, smart. A rolling maturity. So if one matures, let's say next week, I have one that will mature. What I'm looking at is what gives me the greatest interest rate as well as what the cash flow needs would be for the month. So if we have a month that we have a high debt service payment, I want to make sure that those funds are available for expenditures <coughs> as well as diversification. Right. According to our policy, we can only um, invest up to 20 men, million with one issuer. So I am managing that and making sure that if I've maxed out, even though they may have the highest interest rate, our fiscal policy prevents me from putting the, that capital um, commercial paper investment with that issuer. Then I have to look at who has the next highest rate, taking into account um, cash flow issues as well. Okay. Um, I am so glad you sit beside me because I did not take this particular foreign language in college. <laughs> and I just want to let you know, you could call me later. Well, I knew that we had talked uh, about a year ago about you were, you were doing this. Uh, I was going to ask you what your limit was. Do you get close to $20 million with any one limit? We do, Excellent. actually. Um, several times a year, there will be an issuer who just has really great interest rates, and we're able to take advantage of that. Also, with our school bonds, we were able to invest in commercial paper to earn them a little bit more interest on those funds that they will be able to use toward those capital projects. Um, but what we're seeing now is that due to the interest rate in which we finance those bonds, we have a um, yield cap of 1.32%. So in the event that our maturities would be higher than that, I have to watch out for that due to arbitrage. So that's where we then would rely on leaving funds where they are with the um, capital management trust that come in at a slightly lower interest rate. But right now I'm looking at if there's a 30 or a 60 day commercial paper that can be purchased, that's giving them as much up, up to that ceiling as we can, then we're taking advantage of that as well. Have you looked at um, the uh, oil companies or the natural gas pipeline companies? So we have to um, purchase commercial papers that are certified through certain levels, okay. A1, F1, um, and we work with a broker that gives us those options, and he is ensuring that they are also in lines with General Statute 15930. Excellent. Arbitrage is like arbitrage. Yeah, that's what I used to do. Arbitrage, you arbitrage one against the other. Oh, you don't play nice, It's making money without adding any value. Thank you, Tom. I need a tutorial over any, here. Any other questions? We thank you. Okay. People, girl. Thank you, Susan. You're very welcome. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, we'll have Commissioner I, and I reserve the right to recognize two people are making an announcement. So, but I'm going to, any other commissioner's comments before I do that? 
I have one comment, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we need to start talking about a convention center. Um, the, uh, about what? Convention center, sorry. We get $3.1 million in occupancy tax. It's a 3% tax that's uh, levied those for those who uh, stay in hotels in the county. It, it is a tax that must be used for tourism development, and it can only be used for tourism development. There's also some money saved in the tur Tourism Development Authority now. Um, we just passed a budget that has $100,000, $100,051 for tourism development. Um, I think we ought to, I don't think, we're not supposed to have motions during commissioner comments. I don't think this requires <laughs> a motion. Uh, I think we can use some of that money to, uh, to look at uh, a consulting firm that can tell us what we might be able to support in terms <laughs> of capital funding. Uh, what we might be able to attract in terms of people who would who would come to that uh, for various purposes. Um, I don't think it would cost very much money. I think we can do an inquiry and find out what that would cost, and and do a, a do a study to see what what we can do. Uh, so I would like to recommend that the staff look into that. I don't think it requires much. Are you pointing that to the new county manager who would uh, take that up and bring something back in late July? Mm -hmm. um, Putting it to any county manager who would like to, <laughs> <laughs> would like to take that. It's an equal opportunity county manager opportunity. Great little lodge, just saying. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, one, I have asked the Alabama Burlington School System to come before us as a board, uh, at least on a quarterly basis, to report back as to how they're spending funds particularly school safety, capital funds, and things of that sort. And uh, both the new superintendent, who will take the office, I assume, on, I think on July 1st, Correct. Um, and the current county uh, school board chair have agreed to do that. So we will get regular reports in the near future. Um, and so if you'll please take a note. Uh, the second thing, um, we are in a position that we have retained a new county attorney. Uh, his name, as we board members know, is James F. Stevens, and he goes by Rick, but he spells it R-I-K. And I told him he was missing a letter, but <laughs> he reassured me that he was correct. So uh, he uh, will come on board on August the 1st, of this year, um, and Rick has been in local government work for more than 20 years. Um, he not only has an undergraduate degree, um, I had it marked, <laughs> from George Washington University um, and so forth. He also had... Um, you mean he's not Wake Forest, huh? Thank well, God. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> He has a Master's of Public Administration degree from that uh, university in Carborough. What's it called? Chapel Hill. Now determined to be arbitrary. Uh, <laughs> and uh, his George Washington University degree is in international relations, by the way. And he has a law degree from Central University uh, in Durham. So he is well qualified. We really look forward to working uh, with him in the very near future. Uh, and I think you already know him. I hope you do. Uh, if you don't, you'll see him soon. Um, and our current legal staff, you have already met with him as well. Uh, so we all welcome him aboard. He is not here tonight, but uh, said to be sure to say hello to everyone, and we just look forward to having him on board. Now, it's my high honor. Would you please stand? This is our effective July 1st, yep. uh, which is a week from Friday. Yes. Uh, <laughs> our new county manager will be yes. on board. Um, talk about impressive as well. Um, tell us where you <coughs> earned various degrees. Sure. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening. Thank you for having me with you tonight. 
Um, I have a master's degree from that Carborough School as well <laughs> um, in public administration, and I have an undergraduate degree from American University in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Sure. Uh, additionally, where have you been for the last, uh, <laughs> well, how oh gosh? 13 years. <laughs> yes, it'll be 14 years, yes. She is the county manager of Person County. Yes. Uh, I went to a uh, regional meeting recently, um, and the Person County managers, at least three of them, That's came yours. up to me and personally, um, they didn't exactly thank me for stealing you, <laughs> but they told us what a wonderful job we did uh, in having you move to Alamance County. Thank you. Um, they, I think they were sarcastic when they said that they appreciated it, <laughs> but they all said you were doing a wonderful job and we really look forward to you being here. Uh, in addition to that, she's been assistant county manager in Durham County. That was from 2004-2008 uh, and from 2002 to 2004 uh, in different capacities. Mm -hmm. uh, she, as we said earlier, person county manager since July of 2008 mm -hmm. through the 30th. Uh, my last day is the 24th, this, this Friday. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Uh, she's been assistant county manager in Durham County. She's been a senior policy anal analysis. Analyst. Analyst, thank you. You're uh, in Durham County. Uh, oh gosh, it goes on and on. Budget uh, analyst in Orange County from 2000 to 2001. Uh, management analysis in the city of Rickshaw. Uh, she's been a consultant for the uh, town of of Carborough. Carborough. <laughs> <laughs> I could I couldn't resist that one. Not not, not anywhere near Wake Forest. Right? <laughs> not anywhere near Wake Forest. <laughs> and various other positions, including Washington D.C. Yes. We welcome you. Thank you. We look forward to your uh, taking office, and it'll be just a hallway away right here. Great, <laughs> great. <laughs> Well, well, thank you very much. I am very appreciative of the offer and the opportunity to work with the five of you to carry out your goals and directives to um, serve the, the residents of Alamance County and to become part of this vibrant community. And I'm also very excited to work with the Alamance County team. Uh, so I will see you all uh, a week from Friday. Excellent. And thank you for having me tonight. And Mr. Baker? She does canoe, kayak, and so forth. And I have asked her, I think you've met her previously, but I've asked her to help set up another kayaking with various <laughs> officials. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Back in I'm Mohican. Thanks, sir. No one is free that day. <laughs> test her out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me make a comment as well. I've had a number of calls from Person County. Uh, I know uh -oh. a number of people there that have been known for quite a few years, and uh, they all lament the fact that we took you away from them. So, uh, and, and the, the highest the highest level of uh, recognition for your the quality of your work. So thank you. We appreciate that. Thank you. Still make her regret her decision. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, tell me, tell the audience what you told me this afternoon about Person County, the dastardly D they tried to pull. Yes. Yeah, so this morning I had my last board meeting with them, and they have been trying to entice me to stay. Um, they've been asking me every day if I've changed my mind yet. They got me a new chair to sit in and said that I could keep it if I'd stay. <laughs> so I was telling Chairman Paisley that they have um, tried to, to keep me there, but it has not worked. So I, I assure you I will be here <laughs> next Friday. I think we can sw swing a chair, can we not? <laughs> I think Adrian gets first deals on the chair. It's her just about every meeting. Well, please, please when you go back, tell them that I said that that was a dastardly deed. <laughs> I will pass that along. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. You didn't tell her that she doesn't get a chair in her office? Oh, no. I got enough time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we, we can swing a chair. <laughs> I didn't say two, but <laughs> it was tight budget. No, anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll give her a chair. Uh, Okay, any other county commissioner comments? I just want to thank you, Sherry Hook. Oh, thank I you. think you're a rock star. Thank you. You've been through COVID. You were 
Brian's right arm, and you've always been everybody's right arm. Thank you. And um, we're only as good as you because you get to lead us. And I just appreciate every time you always call, <coughs> you find an answer amazingly. And you've just been so easy to work with, and I really want to thank you. Thank and you. I'm just so thankful you're still here. It means a lot. Even those two chicks with you. <laughs> I second that as well. And I you guys do a that. Go ahead, Bill. I just, I was just going to just add, you've done a superb job, and we thank you for all your hard work and effort. Thank you. And uh, well, we look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs> and I want to echo that absolutely as well. She's brought us through good times, bad times, hard times, all kinds of, and done just such a wonderful, remarkable job. And the good thing is for us county residents, she's continuing on to the elevated rank of deputy manager uh, and we really appreciate it thank you and I appreciate she it. doesn't observe office hours either we need to no. recognize that's that. true <laughs> I, I, I i know i've called her since you text messages of what i and i thought i wouldn't get a response until the next day and i it show up within minutes so i, 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 that's I don't sleep that's why <laughs> so, i know I our constituents it. appreciate it when we can get them quick answers so thank you i appreciate it Mr. Turner, anything? Okay. Um, hello, Chris, commissioners. Good evening. Pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11 A3 and 5, I ask that the board move into closed session to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body and to establish or to instruct the public body in negotiating the price or other material terms of a contract or proposed contract for the acquisition of real property by purchase, option, exchange, or lease. The property is located at 3410 Swepsonville, Saxe Hall Road in Graham, North Carolina, 27253, is owned by the Elliott D. Heblethwaite Living Trust and is to be used for landfill purposes. I do not anticipate any public action following the closed session. We have a motion to open the closed session. So moved. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. It's unanimous. We're in closed session. <laughs> uh, motion to close the closed session. Second. Uh, all right. All in favor, signify by uh, saying aye. Aye. Okay. We need to reopen the regular session and then move to adjourn. Yep. Are we not open? We are. Yeah, you're open. Move to adjourn. <laughs> Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 See that one. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.local.gov tvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.